Good afternoon, conformists and contrarians. My name's Danny, my own worst enemy podcast. Right, update time. So, I'm back from my holiday in Tembe, and not a moment too soon, let me tell you. <laughs> I think when we last spoke, um, I'd been there just over 24 hours, I think it was, during which time, you'll remember from the last episode, uh, we found ourselves staying in accommodation situated next to a noisy motorway. Right, that wasn't mentioned in the brochure. Uh, mine and Leanne's bedroom was next door to a couple playing rave music all night till some ungodly hour. And then, uh, yeah, one of the in-laws wound up in <laughs> A&E in an hospital where all the staff looked like bleeding Hollister models. So, yeah, that was the first 24 hours, okay? Well, the fun didn't stop there, let me tell you, okay? So, in no particular order, right, and I'm not making this up, okay? My daughter Hope, my baby daughter Hope, she got conjunctivitis, right? Snotty eyes and her face was all swollen up. Um, Leanne, she's anemic, right? She's got to go get iron infusions every three months or whatever. Um, well, she managed to time it perfectly so that her ferritin and haemoglobin levels or whatever dropped below threshold while we were on holiday. So she was fatigued and dizzy and tired all week. Uh, my dad got some sort of stomach bug, so he was bedridden and being sick for a couple of days. I got my hand trapped in Hope's travel cot. Sort of got that, that like web bit between your thumb and finger, right? Nearly sliced that off, nearly puked it hurt that much. Still hurts to pick anything up now. Um, we took the dogs with us, yeah? One of them pissed on the coffee table. The other pissed on mine and Leanne's bed. No joke, all over the pillows, the duvet, the mattress, everything. What else? Oh, the house is like a bleeding oven, right? You couldn't sleep, it was that hot in there. But when you open the windows, the place turned into a bleeding moth farm as well. So that was a lovely catch-22. Um, took the dogs to the beach, right? Got a, One of them's a, a beagle called Jax. Oh, he just barked the entire time we were there. Barked at everything, barked at kids, barked at dogs, barked at, well, just everyone, right? But it was so embarrassing. It was it was like one of those, um, it wasn't like a busy beach where there was loads of people and loads of noise. It was like one of those kind of out in the sticks, relaxing, kind of quiet beaches. And then you just got this stupid beagle sounding like a bleeding foghorn in the middle of it. So he was ruining everyone's day. Everyone's rolling their eyes and tutting at us. So we basically got shamed off the beach. That was embarrassing. I saw my ass. So, and we'd only been there like, I don't know, about half an hour, 40 minutes. I had to drag the kids away. Um, yeah, me and Leanne ended up having an argument about that. We're shouting our heads off in the apartment. Uh, that upset my mum. <laughs> she started crying, right? Um, what else? Oh, Hope. She started teething recently. Um, she kept us up all night on, I think it was Thursday night or something like that. So when we tried to have another attempt at a beach day um, without the dogs this time, we were just both too bog-eyed to enjoy it. Uh, oh, Leanne got shit on by a seagull while we were there, right? Then she goes to try and hire a windbreaker off this, like this the guy who had like a stall on the beach or whatever. So yeah, she goes she goes over and the guy's like, I don't know, sorting his stock out or whatever. And she's trying to get his attention and he's being ignorant or whatever. So she storms off, sees her ass with him, calls him a wanker or whatever. Turned out he was deaf. <laughs> Brilliant. So yeah, again, kids got like, I don't know, 45 minutes on the beach. Um, oh, then on the drive home, right? So on the way there, we we kind of drove down all the A roads, all the like the country roads and stuff. And uh, I find them exhausting. I know they're very picturesque and all that, right? But I can't handle it because I'm just, those are the kind of roads where I'm just I'm paranoid that some little chav in his Vauxhall course is going to be overtaking on a blind turn and he's just going to wipe the family out. So. I drive slower every corner that we come to. I'm like super red alert and oh, it's just exhausting. So yeah, I want to drive on the motorway on the, on, on the way back. Nice straight line all the way home. So I set the sat nav to take us to the motorway, go through Bristol and that. And uh, it said something like three hours, 45 minutes or something. Perfect. That'll do me. Oh, well, sat nav screwed me, right? At, at some point, it just decided to redirect me away from the motorway, back onto the country lanes took me seven hours to drive home, right? My mum was following in the car behind. She nearly fell asleep at the wheel. It took that long. We had to pull over and let her have a kip so she could get her brain back in her head. I was close to having my second nervous breakdown by the time we got home. So, yeah, brilliant. Five stars on TripAdvisor. <laughs> Jesus. But um, yeah, it wasn't all bad. You know, there were a few 
good moments sprinkled in there, I suppose. But yeah, I won't bore you with those. Right, today's episode. Is it time to abolish psychiatric diagnosis? My guest today is Dr. Lucy Johnston. Lucy is a consultant clinical psychologist, conference speaker, lecturer and trainer, known for taking a critical perspective on mental health theory and practice. She is author of Users and Abusers of Psychiatry, co-editor of Formulation in Psychology and Psychotherapy, Making Sense of People's Problems, and the author of the book which forms the basis of today's discussion, A Straight Talking Guide to Psychiatric Diagnosis. Lucy also writes a blog at Mad in America, where she writes about replacing psychiatric diagnosis with a formulation-based approach that explores personal meaning within relational and social contexts. In today's episode, we discuss why the concept of psychiatric diagnosis is both invalid and unreliable. We weigh up the benefits and consequences of being labelled with a particular disorder, and whether or not it's time to abolish psychiatric diagnosis altogether and replace it with an alternative approach. Okay, So, before we jump into this one, this is one of those subjects where some people get all hysterical, purple-haired social justice warrior about it. So, I just want to take a moment to clarify my position on it, just to save me the earache later, really. So, um, my experience of understanding my situation through the lens of diagnostic labelling, or whatever, was pretty much a negative one I'd say so I've thought a lot about this over the the, the past few months and for me personally I've really failed to identify a single benefit that arose from the label agoraphobia which is my speciality if you like um I think at, at one time I did feel there was a benefit but I think those benefits were more misinterpretations on my part so okay so for one kind of displace the responsibility the sense of responsibility like you know it wasn't my fault I've been possessed by this illness um which I'd say did provide kind of short-term relief but long-term was actually kind of disempowering um I mean because all it really did is I mean it it gave me a negative sense of identity kind of gave me a, a feeling of fatalistic inevitability sense of hopelessness And yeah, it sort of gave the illusion of having been, well, like infected with a a medical illness, like catching the flu. And secondly, I think I I felt like it explained my situation. But in truth, looking back, it doesn't really explain anything. Um, I think I just mistook what was merely a description for an explanation. Uh, I suppose you could argue that maybe there was some benefit in that, you know, it gave me a sense of direction in how to educate myself about what I was going through but I don't know even that was a double-edged sword because it was almost like the more educated myself on the subject the more possessed I became by it and I think yeah ultimately the like the therapeutic techniques that alleviated the suffering were well they were based more on general principles about the concepts of anxiety than they were like specific to agoraphobia if that makes sense however regardless of my experience I can definitely see how, sort of depending on what you're going through, a diagnosis could be extremely helpful. So um, let's take OCD, for instance, um, because I think there's a, a sense of like volition and self-blame involved in, in OCD that doesn't exist so much, or at least not to the same degree that it does in, in, in other anxiety disorders. So an example, um, let's say you suddenly start having intrusive thoughts about harming your newborn baby. And you don't have any prior knowledge about any kind of mental health issues. It's totally understandable that having someone come along and say, look, all right, don't worry. This is a a well-known psychological phenomenon. It's called OCD. You're not a monster or anything like that. It's just like uh, your evolutionary drive to preempt dangerous scenarios gone awry. And, you know, there are zero, as far as I know, there are zero recorded examples of anyone with OCD actually acting on these intrusive thoughts and you know thanks to this label of OCD we can now turn to this specific set of of literature and and well-researched techniques and help you overcome this and yeah I imagine that's got to be hugely beneficial so much so in fact I reckon you could almost argue that diagnosis in something like OCD isn't 
merely like a conduit to treatment, but part of the treatment process itself. You know, I reckon that getting that label would be such a fucking relief. Like, you might, you'd want it printed on a gold certificate and framed. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, to, I think to spend months, if not years, I think the average time for someone with OCD before they seek help is something like 11 years. To spend all that time wondering if you're evil or murderous, you know, just to be reassured that you're not a bad person and that, uh, you know, you're not going to hurt anybody. That's got to be half the battle, maybe. Um, I think there's something similar going on with PTSD as well. That's another one where service user testimony seems to demonstrate like a, a massive sense of relief in, in receiving a diagnosis. But then again, I don't know, is it is it the label that provides relief or is it just having professional reassurance, you know? And if so, does professional reassurance require a label to work? So, I don't know. So, yeah, for me personally, at this point, from my perspective, despite kind of having no utility for me personally, I think there's probably utility in both diagnostic and non-diagnostic approaches. Uh, and I don't know if it's so much a case of one or the other as it is which one when, if that makes sense. Um, which I know kind of it makes me sound like I'm sitting on the fence a little bit, but I have to say, okay, taken as a whole looking at the whole issue more broadly, I've got to say, it doesn't look good for the current diagnostic system the way it is. I mean, as you're about to hear in this conversation I have with Lucy, from a you know a medical and scientific perspective, there's so many fucking holes in it. You can't help but wonder how the entire system is even managing to stay afloat. Um, you know, it's certainly not because of the, I don't know, like the buoyancy of its own medical legitimacy. So then you have to kind of wonder whether or not what keeps it from sinking is maybe, I don't know, political influence or financial interests. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's super interesting, a very contentious issue. And uh, I think what I'd like to do after this episode airs is anyone from the pro-diagnosis camp who fancies coming on the podcast to kind of shore up the other side of the argument and, uh, yeah, dispute any of the points raised in this episode, feel free to get in touch, DM me on Twitter, whatever, you know, the floor is open. Um Speaking of Twitter as well, let me just finish by saying this. So while I was doing research for this episode, I looked at some of the Twitter threads around this topic and specifically the ones where Lucy had been tagged in on them. And just to give you an idea of how contentious this issue is between the, let's call them the pro and the anti-diagnosis camps, in the span of something like three different threads on this topic, uh, hang on, I've got some of these saved here. So... There's uh, accusations of demagogy. Someone got compared to the Night King in Game of Thrones, only less glamorous, apparently. Uh, someone posted the Hieronymus Bosch harrowing of hell painting and said, you know, if you look closely, you can see someone from the opposite side in there. People are calling each other mealy-mouthed, brainwashed. Uh, someone managed to come within a single degree of confirming Godwin's law, calling someone Mussolini and using BNP and UKIP analogies. Uh, the screenshot in each of those conversations and reposting them like look who she's speaking to and look this guy's blocked me and I'm offended and you need to apologize no you misinterpreted what I said and it just goes on and on and on and look right don't get me wrong right I'm not trying to be a spoil sport I love a good Barney yeah grew up listening to hip-hop Tupac and Biggie Jay-Z and Nas Shady Aftermath against Murder Inc all that loved it right but with this I don't know, it's all seems a bit puerile, to be honest. Um, imagine if a, like a service user stumbled across one of these threads and saw the way you lot talk to each other sometimes. I mean, well, my immediate response would be like, Jesus, I'm supposed to entrust my recovery to this lot. Like, it doesn't inspire much confidence. And besides that, besides not being informative to the people outside the profession, it's not constructive between the people within the profession. It seems like... I know it seems like it, instead of trying to engage in a dialogue so you can actually learn from each other and you should always assume that the person in front of you maybe knows something that you don't that's worth knowing but I know it seems like this particular issue has descended into first and foremost how can I prove the other side wrong and then secondly how can I look like a little smart ass and get a few retweets from the sheep in my little echo chamber on Twitter and I don't know maybe I'm reading too much into it but I don't know that's certainly what it looks like from the outside, um, and yeah, there's no excuse for talking past each other like this anymore, that's what I'm here for, people always complaining that Twitter's no good for nuanced debate, 
Well, stop trying to use it for that. Then come on here, talk to me. You get two hours on this podcast, do it properly, civil, in depth, as nuanced as it needs to be. You know, come and debate each other. I'll mediate. Or, you know, if you don't want to talk to each other, debate me. I'm happy to play devil's advocate, whatever. But yeah, as a, a service user myself, if I was to pop a little note in the suggestion box for you guys, it'd say, stop talking bollocks on Twitter. Or at least come up with some more creative insults. I mean, come on, Mussolini and the BMP. Rubbish. The whole point of Godwin's law was to try and stop people using cliched hyperbolic comparisons. 30 years later, we still haven't learned. I don't know. The uh, the Night King insult was pretty good, though. Anyway, all that said, I, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I found Lucy to be very civil, very persuasive, and very engaging to listen to. She was completely open to all my questions, didn't avoid anything, didn't balk at being challenged, and I do challenge her. Um, and she didn't ask me to edit anything out either, and I do give my guests that option. So, yeah, a, a good start to opening this subject up for further elaboration, methinks. So, uh, you can follow Lucy on Twitter. She's at ClinSykeLucy. Uh, if you can't handle the spelling of that, I will include a link in the show notes. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, you can go to a disorder for everyone.com and that's with a number four, a disorder for everyone.com. Uh, they've got plenty of articles on there to get you started. Um, they're also running a bunch of workshops uh, towards the end of the year. If you fancy attending one of those, I've been invited to the, the Liverpool event. I'm going to go along to that, see what it's all about. My first event as well that I've been invited to off the back of this. So I'm looking forward to it. Be interesting to see how attached I am to this agoraphobia label on the day when I've got to travel to Liverpool on my own. Something tells me I'll be wearing it like a bleeding face tattoo. Uh, right, that's enough. Getting longer and longer these intros. Bored myself. Bleeding 20 minutes or something I've been going on here. Right, you know what I'm going to say? As always, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Lucy Johnston. Okay, Lucy Johnson, thank you for joining me. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Right, um, <laughs> going to be one of those subjects today. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got a few of these episodes coming up where I know it's um, it's it's going to rile a few people up, but that's good. It's good for it's good for debate. It's good to have debate as long as we can stay rational, as you say, rational yeah, and, and civil. To each other's perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's exactly what we're going to do today. Today's topic, we're talking about the idea of um, diagnosis versus formulation might be the best way to put it. Um, whether diagnosis is still valid, whether it has a place, whether it should be replaced by this idea of formulations or whether the two should sort of run in tandem. So that's that's the, the topic for today. But as always, before we jump into that, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about you, how you came into psychology and also your, I suppose you'd be on the, the critical side of, of psychology. So also how you came to that perspective as well. What made you, was there a, a particular moment where you were thinking, hang on a minute, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with what's going on here. Okay. Um, because, as you say, this is such a, an emotive, complicated topic, I, I think I'd just like to start with how you're framing it, diagnosis versus formulation. So I, I think actually even framing it like that is, you know, immediately put some people's backs up. And actually, that's not quite how I see it. So I'd like to slightly redefine that. So what I'd like to discuss is diagnosis versus alternative un ways of understanding people's distress of which formulation is one. So I think that might be a less contentious way of looking at it and also a more accurate way of looking at it. But I mean, I th I'm glad you've we've had a chance to make that point because that's frequent how it's presented, you know, this versus that. And then, of course, it sets up for a really unhelpful sort of this side versus that side battle and all the other unfortunate things you've probably seen. Yep. So a uh, little bit about me. I'm a clinical psychologist, been one for many years, and I've spent my career partly in, well, mainly in clinical settings, in adult mental health settings. I've always had an interest with, in working with people at what you might call the severe end of mental distress. Uh, most of my work's been done in community teams, um, in secondary care and on inpatient wards. Um, I've sort of alternated that with 
working in academic and training settings, I think it's actually quite hard to work at the coalface for too long without getting a bit burnt out and needing a change. But I guess there's been a common thread throughout that, whether it's clinical work or academic work or training work or writing, which I also do quite a lot of as well, which is having a what I, what some people would call, what I would call, I guess, a critical perspective on psychiatric theory and practice. So it's looking at the limitations of the current system. And I trace those back to the dominant model, which is the kind of illness by medical model, diagnostic model. And looking at how and why that survived and looking at its effects and impacts and perhaps most importantly, looking at alternatives, because if we think it's not working very well or not working for everyone and not working as well as it should, we need to think about different ways of doing it. Uh, Now, that's a very challenging position to take in some ways, both as a practitioner and as a trainer and writer. And, you know, if you brave or foolish enough to enter into debate on social media because there's, I mean, a huge amount of, well, interests at all sorts of levels, aren't there? Interests at all sorts of levels. So you tend to run up against the very emotive debates that you've seen. So anyway, that's where I am and how I got there. Um, Okay, I mean, a number of people who are part of this loose network, I would say, of professionals and service user survivors who see things in a rather similar way, um, actually bought into it at first. They bought into it as service users, and then that they happened to come across a person or a book or a workshop or something that opened their eyes to something different. Um, so I'm a little bit unusual because I never bought it into it in the first place. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I never had that, oh my goodness, this really isn't really working. You know, what are we doing here moment? And I, in fact, I started reading about psychology, psychotherapy, psychiatry at the unhealthily early age of about 12 and 13. Wow. And, um, well, what, what was, what at 12 or so 13? So why did I do that? Yeah. Why did I do that? Good question. Well, you know, in a nutshell, because like many people are going to, mental health professions you know it's not an accident there are reasons I was a very unhappy young girl very unhappy adolescent very unhappy young woman you know this is many years ago now and I've had my own experiences of you know at times quite extreme distress I've just about managed to avoid getting labeled and diagnosed at various times in my life but I think it could easily have gone the other way so obviously there's a very personal interest but I mean I myself never thought that my experiences were anything other than understandable response to various things that I was struggling with. So that was just an intuitive understanding. And the books that I happened to pick up and read, and this is, I guess, I was growing up still under the influence of some of the kind of 1960s so-called anti-psychiatry ideas. So the books I picked up and read were very much in line with that. They were kind of psychotherapeutically orientated books, or they were kind of, you know, Langian or post-Langian books and ideas. Was any of those books um, Thomas Zass, The Myth of Mental Illness, by any chance? Yeah, I, I mean, I know all those books. Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff, which is still, you know, I'm not an uncritical Zassian or Langian or uncritical anything, I hope, but I think they still have important messages. It's, oh, the Myth of Mental Illness is definitely one I recommend to people, whether you think you're going to agree or disagree with it going into it. It's definitely worth a read just to just to challenge your own ideas on it. I've got an interview coming up in a yeah. few weeks on, on that book. So, yeah, very interesting topic. Um, very interesting. Also, I think I'm, gl- I'm glad you mentioned that as well, that you've got personal experience with feeling unhappy or, you know, what people might consider mental health issues or whatever, because yeah. I think maybe some people might assume with the, the kind of the, the stance you take with, with diagnosis uh, and what we're about to go into, some people might th- might be mistaken for thinking that you're coming at it from purely theoretical, cold-hearted mm-hmm. academic perspective. Mm-hmm. But I think it's it, it's good to make clear that you've kind of got a, a dog in this fight, that you you understand it from a service user perspective, maybe. I, yeah. I mean, I'd pick you up on the word academic. I mean, I think I am sometimes positioned like that. This is a purely academic position. I, I see myself as a clinician primarily. Yeah. You know, I'm mainly a clinician. That's why I trained. It's clues in the name, clinical psychologist. I have worked in academic settings too. But yeah, I don't identify as a survivor because I haven't 
you know, I've avoided the fate of being sucked up in the system. So, but I do identify very much with all, you know, with a whole range of experiences of distress that people talk about. You know, there's not a lot of things that people talk about that I can't, to some extent, you know, identify with. So, yeah, maybe I should, maybe I should be more open about that. I don't know. Maybe that would help. I, well, I think it possibly, it probably would, um, because I think, like you've just said then, you're not, you know, I kind of toss that word out, this this academic sure. title, sure. and that doesn't apply to you, but people... But it probably applies to me. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just, I think, you know, any any kind of, anyone that's working within academia and is, is writing books and if people have got, like, theoretical ideas, I think without actually getting to know that person, you kind of, you're automatically seen as one of these intellectuals in your ivory tower and you just kind of yeah, philosophize yeah. into the masses kind of thing. Um, yeah, with no idea what it's like to live through it. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what, what, what I think would be a good thing to do first, because what we're going to do is we'll spend the first half talking about diagnosis, the concept of diagnosis and the problems with it, and then move on to the concept of formulation. But what I'd like to do before we go into critiquing diagnosis and defining it is to ask, what are you not saying about diagnosis? Let's let's <laughs> let's let's sweep the board and get any and all misconceptions out of the way straight off the bat, so that it's framed properly. Then people know what exactly we're we're, we're getting at. Okay. Well, first of all, we're talking about psychiatric diagnosis specifically, aren't we? Not yes. medical diagnosis in general. Yes. Secondly, we're not talking about all psychiatric diagnoses. So some psychiatric diagnoses are legitimate medical diagnoses. You know, dementia is a legitimate medical diagnosis. You know, there's something, the primary problem is something that happens, goes wrong in your brain, to put it at its simplest. But we are talking about what is sometimes called functional psychiatric diagnoses, things which there isn't established, uh, there aren't established biological causes like schizophrenia, personality disorder, bipolar and so on. So it's not sweeping statements about all diagnoses and there are some kind of intermediate conditions, aren't there? Things like autism where we really don't know. I think, you know, whereas for many of the other conditions, I would say we pretty much do know that there are psychosocial causes so I'm not making a general sweeping statement about diagnosis. That's what I'm not doing. I'm not saying you are forbidden to describe your problem in diagnostic terms and you must drop it immediately and apologise. <laughs> <laughs> in the current system, people need their diagnoses. I always say this in my talks. I always say it very clearly at the beginning. I have in my standard slide. Few people can afford to give up their diagnosis is my first point. And the current system, you need it for access to benefits, services, welfare. You know, we're in a kind of middle stage, if you like. At the moment, you're going to be very lucky you can afford to say sod it to the whole system. Most people can't. Two, whatever happens to the bigger diagnostic system, you have a right to define your experience as you like. Of course you do. You know, that's true. That's actually less true in mental health than in general medicine. You know, so if I go along to my oncologist and he says you've got cancer let's say I can decide to disbelieve that if I want nobody will come after me with a big injection and say no you're lacking in insight you must sign up to our viewpoint so actually we don't usually grant that right in mental health but I you know I am very obviously people have the right to make up their own personal view about how they best understand their problem my beef is, uh, my big problem is that people are not given that choice. People are not put in the picture. You know, again, unlike in general medicine, psychiatric diagnoses are imposed on people. And for some people that works OK. For many people, it doesn't. And for some people, they are actually quite heavily punished for not kind of signing up to this particular system with all its consequences. But whatever happens, you know, whether you want to believe you're experiencing, you know, Voices of your ancestors or some spiritual or telepathic experience or, you know, schizophrenia, if you prefer to see it that way, that, that is up to you. That always should be up to you, I think. So, th I mean, that, that's my, my starting point. Yeah. Like, I don't want to get into an argument with anyone about their personal viewpoint. That is entirely up to them. If it works through, that's fine. And I've always taken that position clinically. So I guess an, an other, another kind of myth that can be around is, professionals who are critical of diagnosis go around forbidding their clients to talk use these terms i mean of course i don't i 
What I think I do that's different is that I have the discussion with people and I hope I have it in a respectful way. So I would always hope to say, well, who who gave you that diagnosis? What did you understand by that? Did you find it helpful? Have you been offered alternatives? Would you be interested in thinking about that, reading about that? Would you be interesting, interested in having that as an ongoing discussion as we work together? I would always do that. But, you know, probably most of the people I've worked with clinically have decided at some level for various reasons to believe in and retain their diagnosis. I mean, to an extent, they don't have a choice. It's in their record. You know, I actually haven't found that a problem in face-to-face work because I really do respect people's right to decide what works best for them. Okay, so... That's what we're not saying. That's what we're you not saying. You are allowed to have a diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, you'll find it impossible to avoid it. <laughs> so, okay, diagnosis. Right, let's, yeah. let's, let's dig into this a little bit now. I guess the first thing to do would be to clearly define the meaning of diagnosis. What exactly a diagnosis is in a psychiatric context and how it's how it's applied and yeah. and then maybe kind of touch upon the well the theoretical foundations for diagnosis as well okay well diagnosis is in itself a rather tricky word because you can use it in a sort of layperson sense you know i'm going to get the problem with my car diagnosed but in medicine what it's usually taken to mean in other branches of medicine is um, something like, you know, I go along to my GP, let's say, with certain experiences that are distressing or I'm in pain or I've got a rash or I've, you know, I'm tired or exhausted or whatever, or I just feel ill or sick or, you know, whatever. And there are sometimes some physical experiences accompanying that, losing weight or whatever. And, uh, any decent GP will know these these are called symptoms, by the way. So these those are symptoms are things that I'm personally experiencing, but which could be as a result of a whole range of other other problems. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why someone might be, let's say, tired and thirsty and nauseous and so on. But any decent GP will have some idea about the possibilities that are associated with certain kind of groups of symptoms, which are my personal reports. And in order to make a diagnosis, the GP or other medic uh, needs to see if there are any signs that can confirm a provisional diagnosis. So, for example, thirst and tiredness could possibly indicate diabetes. So there are tests for that. You look at the amount of sugar in the urine and as opposed to a symptom, which is on the whole a largely personal report that no one can confirm or disconfirm, um, a sign, a physical sign, Actually, you know, it can be fairly ob- objective. There should be so much sugar in the urine and there's, and there's this much. And also, ideally, a sign gives us, it, it's linked by kind of theory and some kind of, you know, research-based understanding to the symptoms. So we know why there is too much sugar in the urine if you've got diabetes and we know how that results in, you know, thirst and waste, weight loss and tiredness. So that's the ideal situation. Of course, not every medical diagnosis kind of falls into that category, but I, that's the kind of the paradigm, if you like. That's the model. So at the point which you've got the sign back, you can eliminate a lot of other possible causes. You have some idea of what's going on at a biological level. You have some idea how that links to what I'm personally experiencing as symptoms. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so what's different in psychiatry is first that in all the diagnoses or except I wouldn't call them diagnoses, but all the diagnoses we talk about, what people are presenting is all at the what you might call symptom level. You know, none of it's objectively verifiable. I feel suicidal, I feel desperate, I hear voices, you know, my mood's going up and down. Can you see how those are all at the symptom level? Because notoriously, we don't actually have any blood tests to see if you actually have got so-called bipolar disorder, so-called schizophrenia. So that's one very big problem. We cannot confirm these, the presence of these so-called illnesses if they are illnesses because we haven't got that far. So strictly speaking, I guess you call those syndromes, not illnesses. But there's another even bigger problem is that nearly all the things in psychiatry that are described at a so-called symptom level are not best seen as, they're not bodily symptoms. They're not things like 
you know, thirst and tiredness and weight loss and all the rest of it. They are unusual distressing forms of thought, feeling and behaviour, which are then wrapped up in medical language. So it's actually quite wrong, I think, to talk about these as symptoms. I mean, that brings the whole medical baggage with it, doesn't it? As soon as we start assuming it's correct to call these ex symptoms. You know, if we call these experiences, difficulties, struggles, problems, then there's no obvious reason to be looking for biological causes for them. And indeed, it's quite rare to have biological causes that make you think, feel and behave in a certain way. You know, there are such things, aren't there? But there is actually no evidence for, the bi for biological causes for most of the diagnoses we're talking about. And on the other hand, there's a mountain of evidence for the fact that these are ultimately understandable responses to people's social circumstances. You know, that's often a complex thing to tease out. So the bottom line is, from my point of view, but it really, really isn't just me. This is another misunderstanding. This wild, mad maverick who's come up with all these crazy ideas. The irony is that this is not just something admitted by so-called critics. It is admitted by the very people who drew up the diagnostic system. You know, it is run into the ground. And I've, I'm going to read some quotes, if you don't mind. This is another long answer. So um, here's the chair of the DSM-5 committee, DSM, DSM being the sort of manual of diagnostic so-called diseases and disorders that is drawn up and revised every 10 years or so. This is one of America's most senior psychiatrists. We've been telling patients for several decades we're waiting for biomarkers. That is actual evidence, like the sugar in the urine, that will actually enable them to say, yes, these are best, these experiences are best understood as illnesses to be diagnosed. We're still waiting. And uh, the chair of the former edition of DSM-4, Dr. Alan Francis, he's been one of the biggest crit critics. He says, DSM is totally wrong and absolute scientific nightmare. I mean, that's pretty damning. So something that really, really isn't appreciated, I think, is it's not about it. It's not in any simple sense about do we hang on to diagnosis or not. You know, diagnosis in its current form is going. This is happening way above the level of any critics, any, you know, annoying psychologists who keep kind of throwing stones at it, you know, any service users who find it helpful. You know, at some point, 10 years, 20 years, this is admitted by the very people who drew it, who drew it up and they're pouring billions of pounds and dollars into developing a new system. Now, what they're not doing is moving away from a diagnostic framework. So that's where I disagree with them. They are saying we're going to have a much better way of diagnosing people and we're going to really look at the biology much more closely and we're going to identify all these different patterns, etc. So they're not giving up the diagnostic project as such, but they absolutely are giving up current categories. You know, that is just a fact and that is a something, I think, that we all need to know about. We all need to face up to those implications. And actually, service users need to be informed about that. And they are not. They are presented with these diagnoses as though they're fact, as though they're truth, as though they're evidence-based. That is absolutely untrue and unprofessional. And actually, I'd go further and say unethical. Okay. A couple of things there. First one would yeah. be, um, so with things like um, with, with schizophrenia and um, in well, depression, well, in all, all kinds of mental health mm. issues one argument against that could be well if you look at like the brains of somebody with schizophrenia in a, under a under neuroimaging there's a there's a clear difference between the brain of somebody with schizophrenia as compared to somebody who hasn't got schizophrenia mm. and surely that represents the the kind of biomarker that we're saying <laughs> doesn't exist Okay, well, first of all, as far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as a person with schizophrenia. <laughs> okay. There is such a thing as a person who's suffering a range of distressing experiences which get parceled up and called schizophrenia. Let's remember Zass here and Lang. Um, secondly, because these are not valid or reliable categories, as admitted by the people who drew them up, in, actually there are no clear differences between people with this diagnosis and people without it. I mean, you may have read differently, but I would say, think about it, look at it, read, read the criticisms of the research. You know, there are lots of vested interests, a huge amount of spin going to supporting this. There's no reason why there should be clear differences between one essentially randomly chosen group of people and another. But 
insofar as there might be some differences which are bound to be sort of overlapping between so-called normals and so-called people with schizophrenia. Well, what does that say? Because it could say a number of things. It could very likely, for example, be the effects of medication, because we know that medication has effects on the brain, often very damaging effects. And secondly, we also know that the kind of difficult traumatic experiences that are very often present in the lives of people who end up with these diagnoses affect the brain. They affect development from very early on. Traumatic experiences have impacts on the body. So this is another myth, isn't it, that critics are kind of denying the role of biology. Of course, we're not denying the role of biology. Of course, all our experiences are mediated biology. They may show up in differences in brain functioning and indeed even in brain structure. In fact, we know they do. But that's very different from saying we've discovered, look, there they are, the biomarkers, you know, that are the causal factors that are implicated in so-called schizophrenia. I suppose, well, sticking with this, um, I suppose, we're, we're on the concept of validity at the moment yeah, yeah. now. So, I guess, well, let's dig into that a little bit more. I suppose one argument would be that a, whether or not a diagnosis is valid is, uh, even if it, a, a diagnosis doesn't refer to an objective entity, something that yeah. can be seen in, in, under, a, under a scan or detected in, in a blood test, yeah. it still refers to a, a psychological phenomenon. Well, yeah. Is that not enough to say a diagnosis is at least valid in that sense, that it does refer to a subjective set of psychological phenomenon? Okay. Well, validity has lots of meanings, obviously. And uh, interestingly, uh, DSM and ICD, which is the kind of European version of the Diagnostic Manual, make no claims to validity. It's quite interesting. They don't even go there. So if you criticise the manuals, they sometimes say, well, these are purely descriptive, which, of course, they're not. All they're trying to do is achieve reliability, which is, you know, has to come before validity anyway. And uh, they've been very bad at that. So that's one point. But you're saying, is it not the case that diagnosis points to something? Yeah. So Um, I mean, let's just just an example would be set of experiences. Yeah. So say the, the nature of OCD is, yeah, yeah. is clearly different from the nature of, of anorexia, at least on yeah, the yeah. at least on the surface of it. So yeah, yeah. surely to some degree that the classification works in di- in dividing the the way the f- these phenomena present themselves. Yeah, yeah. So then does it follow that it's valid in that sense? I guess I guess what I'm asking is even if it's not va- even if diagnosis isn't valid in a medical sense it, yeah, is, it, yeah. is it valid in its own psychiatric or psychological sense? Okay. Okay, well, that's an interesting point because clearly it's a diagnosis is very loosely related often to some particular set of common experiences and people who starve themselves or who get caught up in compulsive rituals sometimes have something in, you know, there are common ways of surviving life struggles, I would say, which do fall into certain kind of patterns. Now, I would say they're psychological patterns, not medical ones. So to a very limited extent, a diagnosis does, as you say, point in a rather wavy arrow kind of way towards a very loose group of people who are, you know, struggling with particular kind of difficulties. But I guess what my beef, is, my, my problem is that as soon as you describe that as a diagnosis, rather than problem identification, let's say, So as soon as you use words like disorder instead of, you know, problems with compulsive behavior or, you know, eating disorder instead of, you know, problems with food, eating distress with, you know, whatever, then you've bought into the whole medical model again. And there's no way back from that. You know, it affects thinking, it affects practice, it affects the way people see their difficulties. It actually blocks off psychological understandings to a very large extent. So the, one of the obvious alternatives to diagnosis is to say, let's start using ordinary language descriptions, which do not make medical assumptions, which are actually you know, just as reliable and more valid. Do you know what I mean? Let's start talking about people who have problems with eating. Let's start talking about people who struggle with compulsion rituals, because these things do exist. 
but let's leave all the medical model baggage out of it. There's no evidence that that's relevant. There's no evidence that it's a helpful way of looking at things. Yeah, that it's 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 more like it's it's something you do, or yeah. it's something you're engaged in, or maybe even something that you're psychologically kind of trapped in, but not something that you've mm-hmm. got, like you've caught a cold. It, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, it's a very good way of putting it. It's it's, and I would say it's a way that you are currently surviving life and its difficulties. Yeah. It's something you do, not something you have. I think it's a very good way of putting it. And as soon as you reify it, I've got whatever it is. I've got depression. I've got anxiety. I've got OCD. Now, of course, people who use those terms are having very real struggles. But then you start investing all your energy in wondering why this mysterious condition has suddenly descended upon you out of the blue. You know, instead of thinking about, at some level, this is a strategy that I need at the moment, you know, to cope with whatever I'm finding difficult. And and those things may not be obvious. This is where a formulation comes in. You know, there are complicated reasons why people end up surviving in that way and using those kind of ideas and strategies. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll dig it a bit more into the, sure. like, the, the benefits and the problems with diagnosis. And I'm going to speak from personal experience as well. And f- for me, it falls more on the, the, the negative consequences than the positive ones. Before that, though, I, oh, go yeah, on. Have you got Can something I just to add? add to that? Yeah. Sorry. Given the points you've made and I've, we've just discussed, you know, I would certainly agree that in the current system, diagnosis has some uses because it's the only thing we have that does point you towards people with dif- similar difficulties and possibly useful forms of help. You know, so it's not about forbidding charities to call themselves OCD charities. It's not, you know, it's not about forbidding people to use their diagnoses as, as a kind of signpost. But in a better system, you know, we'd have a better way of describing those difficulties. Yeah. Um, yeah, before we move on, it, this idea, I think it's important, the idea of um, reliability and how reliable these diagnostic criteria are. So They're not. Well, they're not. <laughs> You know, and and that's this. Your own research shows that. <laughs> yes, I mean, if, so if if it was something like heart disease or lung cancer, from one patient to another, the same criteria are going to lead to the same diagnosis every single time. It's going to take a pretty incompetent yeah. physician, given given the right set of tools and circumstances, to, yeah, yeah. to to misdiagnose those things. But if you'd just like to kind of speak on that a little bit and why diagnosis isn't isn't reliable. Why diagnosis isn't reliable? Well, first of all, you're right, it isn't reliable. And there's always a big deal made about each subsequent edition of the diagnostic manuals. This is more reliable before, and and this never seems to be true. And in a sense, anyone who's worked in services or been through services know that, because people end up, I think, as an average of five or six diagnoses during a kind of standard psychiatric career. So... You know, that's what happens. And diagnoses change over time. You know, every nowadays, everyone's got bipolar disorder, apparently. When I first started working, I only saw one person in my first three years who apparently had what was then called manic depressive disorder. So all this is very strange. And so it, it actually makes a nonsense of any such phrase as the wrong diagnosis, because not only can you not confirm a diagnosis in psychiatry by saying, look, we've done the test, nor can you disconfirm it. You know, so it's The infinite flexibility of psychiatric diagnosis actually is quite useful in some senses um, because it can be used, you know, really quite cynically to exclude people from services, for example. You don't meet our criteria. You see that all the time. So it's, it's not reliable, but it's interesting to think about the reasons it's not reliable because reliability means the likelihood that two clinicians faced with the same person Uh, will come up with the same idea about what diagnosis fits them. And the way they do these reliability tests when they're drawing up the manuals is they typically choose people who are meant to be kind of typical examples of, let's say, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, and they have people who are well rehearsed in the criteria. So that's actually not very like real life, where nearly everyone falls between the criteria, and that's why they get so many diagnoses. And one of the interesting things is that even with these so-called typical patients with typical so-called symptoms and, you know, well-rehearsed psychiatrists, on average, you know, reliability is not a lot better than guesswork. And that goes across the diagnoses. I see it a lot just sort of anecdotally. So I, I run a mental health support group. I meet a lot of people there. It's The, the, the group's up into the thousands now, about 5,000 people yeah. signed up. I've met hundreds, if not 
however many people. And it's so common for people to tell the story that they first got diagnosed with this, but then it got changed to something else, which on the face of it might not sound so bad because it might sound like, well, you know, over time you're kind of honing the diagnosis and, and <laughs> ho- honing, in, like or honing in on something. But one of the, one of the more problematic consequences of it is people are flipping medications left, right and centre to try and suit yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. diagnosis they're given. And, and, and I think another thing worth saying is the, the diagnostic criteria might work with, with someone that's got just the one disorder... <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. If they've just... Disorder in quote marks. Yeah, if yeah. they've just got that... Yes, the disorder in quote marks. <laughs> um, yeah, if they've just got OCD or they've just got generalised anxiety. But, I mean, you take someone like me, for instance. So, in running through my diagnostic labels, the, at the heart of it was, was hypochondriasis, just this obsession with being ill, thinking I'm ill all the time and, and stressing about that. But then there was a lot of body checking, a lot of compulsive body checking, which could run into dozens maybe hundreds of times a day but then that might subject me to the 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 old OCD label I struggled with going out as well I stayed in the house a lot which makes me an agoraphobic but also I was struggling with panic attacks at the same time so is that panic disorder or is that agoraphobia with panic disorder but my agoraphobia was particularly bad when I was out amongst people and crowds so is that social phobia as well <laughs> and then with with somebody you were probably like quite miserable, so you were probably depressed as well. Yes, I know. I, I was. I, I went through a period of that as well. Um, let's uh, well, let's keep going. Um, I went through a short period of, of of suicidal ideation, which afterwards made me monophobic, as it's called. I didn't feel. I didn't trust being left by myself. So yeah, I mean, yeah. once you bunch all them together, he's got yeah. depression, agoraphobia, panic disorder, hypochondriasis, monophobia. Mm. Sh- surely it loses all meaning by that point. It does. It does lose all meaning. It does lose all meaning. That's an absolutely typical story. And that shows up in the kind of overlap between categories. And if you look at DSM, you have all these kind of, you know, mixed categories like schizoaffective disorder. And you sometimes see people with schizoaffective disorder in the context, in the context of, you know, personality disorder traits. Do you know what I mean? It's nonsense. And the core of the problem is that ultimately these are not medical judgments, but subjective judgments. You know, how distressed is this person? You know, is this normal in a sense? Is always at the core of the judgment. You know, all of these judgments are that make up DSM ultimately come down to personal, social, and cultural norms. How do we expect people to behave in this particular society in these kind of situations? You know, those are not medical judgments, that, and people are certainly very often very distressed and may well be in need of some kind of help and support but you know these are not they're not presenting with diseases or illnesses in a medical sense so you're i mean at an intuitive level people know you know it, i never find it very difficult to convince people of this because at an intuitive level people they've lived it they know it's rubbish and they also know that each subsequent diagnosis fail to produce the magic solution yes <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, before we move on to formulations and start digging into that, I would like to kind of close this up by running through some of the, the benefits and the, the pitfalls of, of receiving a formal diagnosis. And mm. let's start, well, let's start with the benefits. What are the, okay. the, the upsides to it? And from, I think from both a, cl- a clinical, from the clinician's perspective and f- for the, the service user, what are some of the benefits of a formal diagnosis? Okay. Well, in current systems, there are obviously very practical important benefits like uh, I may be eligible for services which I need I may be eligible for welfare or other kind of benefits Uh, I may be able to use this diagnosis to get in touch with relevant self-help or support groups etc at a personal level people often report saying well I'm so relieved because now I know somebody knows what's wrong I'm going to get help so there can be a sense of relief that as we've just discussed, that often tends to be illusory because it isn't the fact that there are clear-cut diagnoses that lead to kind of helpful forms of intervention, or at least it often isn't the case. People also often report, and this is important, I don't feel so guilty anymore. You know, I don't have to blame myself. And that is also important, but I think that's as a result of really rather, I've discussed this in my book, rather primitive ways as a society we have about thinking about 
emotional distress. So people tend, I think, to fall into this polarisation, which you read everywhere in the papers. It's around in people's heads. Either it's my fault or someone else's fault or my parents' fault or something, or and I ought to pull myself together or there's nothing wrong with me or someone is to blame or it's a brain disease. It's absolutely not my fault. I can't help it. And essentially some external force is going to fix it. You know, those are really primitive polarities. And of course, presented with that, people are likely to choose the second one, aren't they? It's not my fault. And I don't have to go into all this stuff. And perhaps I don't have to look at a lot of painful stuff that may be around. So I know we're coming on to formulation in a minute, but as I see it, formulation is a kind of a way through the middle of that. It's something between what is sometimes called the brain or blame sh- trap. It's all in my brain versus you know blame, blame and so on. And uh, yet another thing people say, and this is also important, I feel validated. I feel someone's understood my suffering and noticed that I'm really struggling. And, and that is really important. But I guess what I would say is there are other better ways of validating your distress, which don't come with all the negative baggage of diagnosis. Yeah, one of the one of the interesting ones that people seem to say is that they find it explanatory, like it helps them understand their yeah, condition. Yeah. But I suppose with the, with the DSM, the way it works, that's not yeah. the, the the DSM isn't a, an explanatory document, is it? It's purely descriptive. Yeah. Well, uh, strictly speaking, DSM. Well, it's like you know, people shift their position when you start criticizing the the system. They say, "Well, we're only." You know, we're only offering to description, but I mean, other times it's offered as explanation. But you're right, I've discussed this in my book as well. It sounds like an explanation, so of course people feel relieved initially because they think they've got an explanation, but it's always circular. Why do you hear hostile voices because you have schizophrenia? How do you have schizophrenia because you, you hear hostile voices? You know, why do I have these extreme mood swings because you have bipolar disorder? How do we know you have bipolar disorder because you have extreme mood swings? So it's a circular argument it's not an explanation it's a kind of pseudo explanation but it's also a pseudo explanation that comes with huge costs attached to it i suppose one of the one of the ways that diagnosis is tied in with an explanation is through the i think is it called the biopsychosocial model yeah yeah so i mean therapists i've encountered of of <laughs> you're laughing <laughs> <laughs> Well, so they they've used that as um, so they t- they tie the biopsychosocial model to the diagnosis, and then it does explain where this diagnosis has come from. The, the idea of genetic susceptibility and the environment that you grew up in, and those on the face of it sound similar, tentatively similar to what formulation is, which is kind of providing a narrative understanding of, of your situation. But I loved that laugh. <laughs> so what, <laughs> what, what was what was behind that? And what do you think of that? The idea of, of, of tying the two concepts together, which gives you a description and an explanation. Okay, well, to my mind, a formulation is much, much, much closer to what you genuinely call an explanation. And uh, as a slightly separate point, I mean, you know, I, 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 do, I do get quite fed up with this kind of we're all biopsychosocial <laughs> narrative, which is very convenient. <laughs> and there are several problems with that from my point of view. Firstly, everybody in mental health claims to be biopsychosocial now. What is people experience on the ground? Bio, bio, bio. Do you, do you know what I mean? That's the first thing. And secondly, it's a conveniently vague term. It's a rhetorical device, I think, often, uh, which allows us, you know, to define the bio. Is the bio the obvious fact that, as we've already said, there are physical, biological aspects to all human distress, and it may be useful to look at those in a trauma-informed model. You'd definitely be looking at that. Or is it bio as in these are actually diseases, disorders, just like diabetes, all the other nonsense we're told? But the ambiguity of that actually allows the strong sense of bio, the disease model, to continue because everyone just says, oh, but we're all biopsychosocial now. And the problem of that way of looking at it is that the psych- in, in practice, the psychosocial, all the things that happen to you get seen as triggers of the underlying disease. I mean, it's absolute nonsense when you unpick it. So you go along, you have your first interview, 
you know, you take your history, this awful thing happened, you know, I was abused by my stepfather, I lost my job, you know, I haven't got enough money to live on. These are all noted down, probably never revisited. I mean, I'm slightly stereotyping it, but these then become seen as triggers of the, now we get on and treat the bipolar disorder. So it's incoherent in theory, I would say, the biopsychosocial model, depending on how you define it. And there are very good professional, I would say, interests in not defining it too closely. And it's unhelpful in practice. That's my little rant. Okay. <laughs> another yeah. one, which... Um... Try, try, try another one on me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I think there might be, I think there's possibly something in, in, in this one. So the idea that receiving a formal diagnosis enables the clinician to apply evidence-based therapy. So, you know, CBT or whatever therapy is often studied with these different disorders or so-called disorders in isolation. So we take people with OCD and we study that and apply and try different therapies and, and see how they work out. And we do the same for people that present with these different psychological phenomenon and the, yeah, yeah. And, and the kind of passed out in, in, in that sense so that the evidence-based therapy if you, if you went to your clinician with OCD well then they've got a stack of evidence-based therapy they've got all this research that says well specific to the symptoms that present in OCD this type of therapy is likely the most likely to to help that person yeah yeah I've heard this one too <laughs> <laughs> okay I mean Okay, here's my little disclaimer about CBT. I know a lot of people who work with CBT in a very sophisticated and helpful way, and I think it can be really useful. There are also a lot of sort of narrow versions of it around, and there's a whole lot of rhetoric around CBT, which in some versions really is the kind of psychological equivalent of, you know, the biomedical model. It's medical model psychology, I call it. So there is claimed to be a huge evidence base for CBT specifically, you know, nearly always. Well, what's the evidence base for any problem you care to mention in psychiatry? I can tell you, you don't have to look at the nice guidelines. It's medication plus CBT. There, I've saved you a lot of reading. But if you actually look at, you know, what the evidence says, there is very, very, very little evidence that CBT has any specific advantage over any other ther therapeutic approach for any particular kind of problem. Very little. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't have some quite useful techniques. So I, for example, think some of its anxiety management stuff is quite useful. I think some of its OCD stuff is quite useful. But, I mean, speaking personally, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people with so-called OCD and I've, I've ne never used that stuff. Do you know what I mean? I've had some really quite remarkable pleasure of seeing people recover you know, very largely or completely, because OCT is what it is about something, and I'm much more interested in the in the about something. Maybe you sort of add on some CV techniques on the top. So I I really query the whole evidence based CBT for this disorder rhetoric, but I would also say that to the extent it's true, let's call it problems, not disorders. You know, there's I have no problem with saying. You, you know, for example, there's a huge body of evidence about hearing voices that comes outside psychiatry, the hearing voices network. They define hearing voices very non-medically. And for some people, hearing voices are a problem. There's actually a lot of literature and research and interest about the specific problem of dealing with hearing voices defined non-medically, largely non-medical approaches. That's very useful. So that has applied to something like ritualizing yeah i don't have a problem with that but that is not within a diagnostic model okay i'll shut up now yeah no i was just gonna um i think you've kind of already answered it though there i was gonna pick you up on you said that um you think that with with cbt some of the ocd stuff works quite well and some of the anxiety stuff works quite well for some people yeah so but that's that... part of the problem I've, I've, I've yet to see someone cured by the standard take an example i've yet to see anyone cured but there may be some people, but I've had quite a long career by simply applying the nice recommended CBT for OCD package. But you are saying that there are, there are um, certain CBT methods that apply better specifically to something that would be perceived as OCD and something that would be perceived as anxiety. I think CBT can offer some useful strategies. Yeah, I, I don't buy it as a model. And 
the strategies, I think, are non-medical strategies and should be offered in a non-medical framework to things that are problems, not things that are described as illnesses or disorders. Right. Okay. Right. Let's finish up with the talking about the personal consequences, the negative effects of receiving a formal diagnosis. And if you just kind of run through a few of those and depending on what you say, I might have my own examples to add as well. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Well, a lot of these are doc- well documented, of course, aren't they? Stigma and, you know, it's it's close cousin, which we're much less interested in, discrimination, you know, being excluded, socially excluded, in addition to the personal sense of shame or difference. Yeah, so this would be somebody becoming known as a schizophrenic, for, in, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I mean I, this is another of my little rants, but I have a big, big problem with the anti-stigma campaigns because I've got this rule of thumb, the more a political party goes on about we must remove stigma, the less likely they are to actually invest time, money and resources into the problems that lead to mental distress. So we've got Theresa May making a very big deal about stigma and, you know, cutting people's benefits and increasing inequality and all the rest of it. You know, so it's and actually the simplest way of reducing stigma is not to diagnose people. It's kind of actually not very difficult. There's a lot of evidence that's Stigma is very closely related to a much more toxic in more individualistic societies that um, are buying into the medical model. A lot of evidence from around the world about that. So stigma is a big thing. Obviously, it's a very high price to pay for the other benefits. Uh, but, and I guess more subtly, it's a kind of defining someone's reality for them you what you've told me is that what leads me to um impose on you a particular version of reality that you now have a psychiatric illness or disorder is an extraordinarily powerful thing to do it's an extraordinarily powerful thing to do something that's done quite routinely and recklessly in psychiatric services I mean, that's what they're set up to do that's the that's their basis in a sense but i sometimes describe it as you go in to see some of the person with a problem, you come out as a mental patient with an illness. You know, that is a big, big, big deal. And, you know, many years ago, I have studied half a degree in philosophy. So language is important to me. Language defines our reality. Language defines, you know, the way we think. Language ultimately sets the scene for everything else that follows. So once you see yourself as having an illness or disorder, you know, it can set you on a lifelong path of um, a psychiatric career. I'm sure you've seen this. You know, recovery rates are, are well, I've, I've spent a bit of time searching for overall recovery rates from people who go into psychiatric systems. They don't appear to exist. No one appears to be measuring them, which is interesting. But I mean, your personal experience, I'm sure, would suggest that it's very much the exception for people to go into psychiatric hospitals or systems and come out recovered, you know too long it's introducing this third party into your life forever and that's a lot of that can be traced back to the, all the other more subtle impacts of, Ill, of a diagnosis which is like conceptualizing problems as illnesses so you stop looking at the psychological factors you stop looking at the social causes you give a message that actually in some sense is very disempowering is shaming encourages you to rely on external solutions sets you aside from other people encourages people to relate to you differently you know the whole lot the whole lot and i would see that all as being set in motion by the application of a diagnosis the redefining of someone's reality in this very powerful way that is not actually evidence-based so my personal experience of, of of being diagnosed wasn't i didn't enter the psychiatric system and so my i think my example serves as, as quite a, a powerful one of how just how influential these words and like you're talking about the, the the language can be so i didn't enter into the the psychiatric system and was there for a long time my initial yeah. experience was i'd been struggling for a while with at the time was predominantly hypochondriasis and agoraphobia and so i went to see a cbt therapist and it was just the consultation phase it was just a, a consultation meeting and after talking to talking to the, the therapist for a while she just said yeah that's that sounds like agoraphobia 
That's mm. that's all. That's as far as my diagnosis went. It wasn't a clipboard. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, there was no printouts with you've got this and let. But so, and there could be worse diagnoses as well. Yeah, more stigmatizing diagnoses. Yes. Yeah. And even though it was kind of a very informal, it was kind of, it was thrown out there during a consultation phase, getting that, hearing that from a professional, because at, at that point I didn't know anything about mental health, I hadn't read about it, I mm-hmm. just knew I was, I just knew my head wasn't right. And just receiving, hearing that word from that person who's obviously a, a trained therapist and they know more about it than me. Expert, yeah. An expert. Um, I kind of, I took that, diagnose that that word away with me and then I kind of I became an agoraphobic it became my identity um yeah yeah I didn't I didn't have any idea about whether you know it was it was caused by a trauma whether it was a a load of different factors life stresses or anything it was just something that had happened to me my brain had changed or I'd just kind of caught something I knew I knew I hadn't caught a virus that had given it to me but I just I'd I'd got I'd gotten agoraphobia and You've got a thing. I, I've got a thing. I've got this thing, and um, well, then what I did on it, you know, I start to read up about it and educate myself on it. And I've got to say, all that happened then is it just snowballed. It, things just got worse because it almost became a self fulfilling prophecy. Every every, the more I read about it, the more I found out that this symptom is involved or that that kind of behaviour is involved. I started to indulge in those behaviours anyway. It was almost. It was like I was being led down that that path, and yeah, yeah. Which you know, the accusation there could be that was just me being weak willed, or um, you know, just feeling a bit sorry for myself or whatever. And that's fine. I'd, I'd, I'll, I'll take that, but it doesn't make it any less troublesome. You know, no. I, I'm imagining that if if someone can kind of just toss out a, a, that informal diagnosis, then if, if you get kind of embroiled in the system. And yeah, you, yeah, and you've been treated by professionals as an agoraphobic or as a, a schizophrenic, then that's you know if it affects me that much, just that that small experience, then I imagine it can be really quite damaging if it's a bit more long term than that. The other thing that happened was again with this becoming a kind of an expert patient, if you like, I developed a I developed a sort of fatalism about my situation. It was just that. I was I was kind of just being pulled towards this this destination. There was nothing I could do about it now. I'm an agoraphobic. I've the the switch the switch has flicked, and now all these other stories that I'd read about other people and um, trying to I started reading like studies and stuff going on PubMed and trying to find out what the prognosis was for agoraphobia, and then just reading that you know this this percentage of people will never get better. Well, of course, I you know I worry then that am I am I in that ten twenty percent of people that are never going to get better? So that was that was how it was kind of damaging damaging for me, and it took a lot of reading, a lot of education to actually think. Well, hang on a minute, I haven't got anything. I, I'm not an agoraphobic. These are things that 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 I'm doing and that are sort of tied up with my the the with stress biology and things like that. But without that massive level of self-education i mean I'd, yeah you'd be stuck with it i don't know where i'd be now i kind of i dread to think where i'd be now so yeah 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 that's a, a really 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 good explanation and what makes it particularly powerful is that, as you say in a sense this was a minor example you weren't in a psychiatrist's office being told you had a schizophrenia or personality disorder but it, the very similar themes of feeling you know, having a stigmatised, adopting a stigmatised identity or having one offered to you or imposed on you, which has enormously powerful effects. I think that's, you know, you should write that up somewhere. Maybe maybe, maybe you have. I think, I think that just illustrates all the points very well and it's all the more powerful for being, in a sense, a relatively, as you say, minor brush with mental health. Yeah, yeah. The, the counter to that, I guess, is there are a number of stories out there of people, I mean, maybe you'd identify with this as well, uh, who have... Um, who are many of whom are quite prominent nationally and internationally known survivor campaigners and activists who would date their recovery from the point they rejected their diagnosis. You know, someone came along and offered them a different view. It sounds like you found your view through reading. Sometimes it's through that, sometimes it's through a professional who offered it differently, sometimes it's through an organization like the Hearing Voices Network. From that point on, 
they were able to follow different paths and actually lead Sir Cowdery behind. But that often seems to be a necessary first step. Yeah, I think uh, I would describe my recovery. Um, I'm not all the way there, but the, the majority of the way. Um, my recovery started when I decided to take responsibility. Now, oh, yeah, yeah. let me tell you, Lucy, using that term, that terminology especially running a mental health support group, the amount of arguments I get into by using that terminology, but I stand by it. It was, it was when, I, when I decided to take responsibility for myself and, and make this my thing and my journey, because that's the other thing I feel it, t- it took away from me. It was like, you're an agoraphobic or you've got agoraphobia and there's nothing you can do about it. That's just what you are now. And, t- and having that, that idea that there was anything I could do about it that there was any kind of role that I could play, having that taken away from me was hugely disempowering. Well, that's also very interesting because one of the messages that can, on the one hand, be a relief of a diagnosis is taking away responsibility. I can't help it. It's not my fault, the stuff we talked about. But, of course, feeling disempowered and reliant on expert advice and stuck with something, as you say, is really not helpful. And some people are able to say, right, I'm reversing that. I'm taking responsibility for myself. I guess some people are maybe less able to do that. And to my mind, a formulation is something that's a midpoint between you are not responsible and you are totally responsible. You know, a formulation, to my mind, is a way of um, understanding how people got where they were and how a lot of things have happened for which, you know, they cannot possibly be responsible, but how with support they can start to take up some responsibility and start pushing their lives in the right direction again. Well, perfect segue. So <laughs> let's get to it. So what it, what exactly is is a formulation? And also, if you could give us a little background on it, where did it where did the idea come from? Did, where did it first emerge? And and what exactly is it? Okay, it's not anything exactly. It's one of those vague words. Um, okay, so well, first of all, I want to put formulation in a bigger context um, like we said right at the beginning because when people talk about alternatives to diagnosis what I've recently started saying very explicitly because otherwise people misunderstand it is the alternative diagnosis is not formulation that may be an alternative the alternative diagnosis is listening to people's stories so in a way I prefer the overarching word narrative or story okay what diagnosis does is exclude people's stories stop people from telling them stop people from listening to them everyone comes along everyone in distress comes along with a story to tell we can't get very far without working out what that story is so formulation is a particular way of hearing someone's story but it's not the only way and throughout history and cross-culturally there are lots of ways of telling stories you know through music poetry art ritual you know all the rest of it in Particular settings, I'm talking about Western psychiatric settings, this particular thing called formulation has gained some credibility, has some research to support it, and can be quite a useful tool for promoting change as an alternative to diagnosis. So this particular version of a narrative that's called a formulation is, I mean, I guess you could call it a a kind of hypothesis, a theory about this person sitting in front of me the difficulties they've had, how those have led to their current situation, and this can inform the best way forward. Unless we have a theory about what caused this, which isn't based on all this nonsense about chemical imbalances and so on, we won't be able to work out the way forward. But it's centrally about, um, it's different from a medical theory about, you know, how you develop diabetes or whatever, because it's centrally about personal meaning, you know, people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors people's experiences of stress have to be based on an understanding of what it meant to them what did it mean to you let's say to be put into care when you were young or to be you know beaten up by a partner or you know to be unable to afford to buy decent clothes or whatever it is um so one of the ways i like to describe it is that um it's an evidence-based story so over a period of weeks months perhaps longer hopefully a an individual and someone they're working with would be able to draw on two forms of evidence and the evidence that the clinician can usually bring is 
you know, their knowledge of research, literature, perhaps information about the impact of trauma on people's brains and bodies, just as an example, attachment to literature and so on, and their clinical experience. You know, other people I've met who've been through these experiences have found this helpful, have reacted in this way. And the equally important form of evidence to add into that is what the client themselves brings along what happened to me, how I felt about it, how I experienced it, how it makes sense to me. So you put those two things together and you have ideally what you might call an evidence-based personal narrative or can also be called a very personal hypothesis or theory that applies to that particular individual. And this is not a one-off set in stone. This is about an evolving understanding. This is something we revisit. This is something the clinician may, you know, offer to write up as a kind of goodbye letter at the end and so on. So essentially, I think what it does is offer in the place of the pseudo explanation of the, that diagnosis offers a, a real personalized individual explanation that isn't doesn't come from nowhere, that's based on evidence and experience that makes sense to the person that they co-create, that's very much their construction when it comes down to it. It doesn't make sense to them, it won't be any use. And that helps to point the way forward. Well, um, um, well, just to clarify, is it is somebody kind of creating an autobiography to an extent? Well, in in a way, yeah, yeah. with with a kind of particular focus on the more traumatic aspects of their story. Well, that's one way of looking at it. There should also be an equally strong focus on the survival aspects, the strengths and resources. Yeah, I mean, an autobiography is another narrative, isn't it? So I guess this is a narrative that is particularly shaped to understanding the particular difficulties comes along that someone comes along with. How do you choose how do you choose a starting point for a formulation? Well, you know, there's lots and lots of different formulation practice. So, you know, a CBT formulation, which I think sometimes can be useful, sometimes it'd be quite rather mechanistic, would have a little say those little boxes to <laughs> to fill in what are your troublesome thoughts, how do you react to them, how do you then behave, how do you then feel? And it would have a kind of set of little boxes taking you back into the past if that was thought to be relevant. I mean, I, my personal preference is to have a more quite low-key evolving conversation, if you like. So in some sense, it seems to me a formulation is the kind of outcome. It's a process more than a thing. It's the outcome of an ongoing therapeutic conversation, which at some point it may be useful to write down and summarise and share and check so that we can both then come back to it. That's my practice and my formulations that... Uh, you know, all things that I've helped to construct can often be quite lengthy, well, as opposed to kind of particular diag- diagrammatic ones. How do you separate the idea of a, a formulation from that, the the like the biopsychosocial sort of narrative? Because it seems that it could be it could be very similar in, in creating a formulation. If somebody say they go back to the um, being maybe they were bullied in high school, and obviously that had traumatic effects and affected their behaviours moving forwards into to adulthood. That could almost be seen similar to saying that the bullying was a trigger for yeah, yeah. feeling feeling depressed or maybe I don't, body dysmorphic disorder or something. So how do you separate the two, define the two? Okay, very good point. <laughs> um, okay, so if I tell you a little bit about the bigger picture, I think that might make put that question in context. So for many, many years, formulation has been a jargon word that no one except clinical psychologists ever knew anything about and uh, was practiced almost exclusively by clinical psychologists. Um, With the general collapse of the diagnostic rhetoric and agenda, and I don't think it's a coincidence at all, formulation has become really, really, really kind of big business. I think you may have seen that from some social media discussions. Suddenly, it's the best thing since size sliced bread and it's everywhere and it's now embedded for example in the new mental health core skills education and training framework and the longer term aim is that all mental health professionals and related professions perhaps like people who work in housing or probation or wherever else should at least have some knowledge about formulation it's got really big the royal college of psychiatrists has produced their own guidelines but um very closely based on the very first set of guidelines that have ever existed in the world, to my knowledge, about 
a really comprehensive look about how to put together a formulation in a kind of ethical and evidence-based and reflective and collaborative way, which I and a small group of people drew up in 2011. So these are the Division of Clinical Psychology official guidelines for best practice formulation. So long before it got this big, it seemed to me and to others in my profession that if we're going to claim this as a core skill, we need to be doing it, you know, it's odd there's no guidelines, we need to be doing it properly, ethically and professionally. Now, at that point, back in 2011, we were able to see and sense very correctly, as it turned out, that this was about to get get very big. And as always happens when something quite... Um, sort of minority interest in a way becomes the orthodoxy you know look what happens to the recovery agenda there's a risk it gets co-opted and it becomes instead of alternative to the current system it becomes an addition to even a support to it so in those guidelines we made a very clear distinction and to the best of my knowledge we're the very first to make that distinction i think it remains a crucial one between psychological formulation which is actually an alternative to diagnosis. So, you know, your hostile voices seem to be a response to the abuse you've experienced and the awful things that have happened to you and the voices seem to relate to what was actually said to you at the time. That's a rather cliched example of a psychological formulation, which would be instead of a diagnosis of schizophrenia. But there's also such a thing that we call a psychiatric formulation, which would be exactly as you described. It'd be much more like, you were abused as a child and this triggered your illness of schizophrenia. Now, that is also called a formulation. But to my mind, to our minds, those are two very, very different creatures. And it's the second thing, which is essentially along the lines, as you say, of the kind of you know orthodox biopsychosocial model, is the one that's got big. There are signs of formulation being co-opted and kind of used to fill the gaps in the diagnostic Categories and explanations, because the current rhetoric is, OK, we know diagnosis has got a few holes in it, but luckily we all do formulation now and that fills the holes. Does, does, does that kind of make sense? So it, yes, it does. That's a very appropriate question and a very important political question. It does. I guess the, the, the question that springs to mind is, and we've already talked about this, this the, the, the idea of the importance of language. Yeah. I suppose you could almost say that that the distinction that's been made between the two there is a- almost seems on the face of it just a rhetorical difference. Yeah, yeah. But it isn't. It's absolutely fundamental. Um, you're right. It's absolutely fundamental. And that's why I'm... What do people mean by formulation? It's always worth asking. Everybody got to be formulate now. Well, great, up to a point. So we started by saying, is there a diagnosis versus formulation battle? And I was saying, no, I don't think it is nearly that simple. But I think it does make sense to argue that there is a battle, a political, a professional, to some extent, an ideological battle for who defines and owns formulation. Yeah, that, that that's a big one. Yeah, I suppose it, throwing that accusation at it, like it's this is possibly just a, an argument about the use of language. Yeah, it isn't. Well, e- even if it even if it was, that's kind of belittling and underestimating the importance of language, which I think is one one of the one of the main things people should be considering when they're thinking about this. That language, even if it was just that the distinction was just a rhetorical one, yeah. that language and terminology really does really does matter, especially for the for the service user. Yeah, there's very little more important, I would say. And I, so I just want to add that if we see this as to some extent, if the real battle, or one of the real battles, there's a bigger battle, is about the definition and ownership of psychiatric versus psychological formulation, I really want to make clear that that's not psychiatrist versus psychologist. This is another of those tiresome accusations. There's a group called the Critical Psychiatry Network, um, consist, representing 200 plus um, UK psychiatrists, who've come out publicly and said, we need to replace diagnosis by narrative formulation, by psychological formulation in a way. I mean, that's fantastic and brave of them. And I've worked with many psychiatrists who do use what I would call psychological formulation in a very sophisticated way. And there's an awful lot of members of my own profession who are very, very thoroughly wedded to psychiatric formulation, who are not about to give up diagnosis anytime soon, even if diagnosis is going to give them up. (laughs) 
So it's really, really not a this profession versus that profession battle. I guess the biggest question would be, so if we go back to the, the criticisms around diagnosis, the main ones that we, we focused on were the idea of, of reliability and validity. So I guess the, the natural question to arise from that is how reliable and how valid is this idea of psychological formulation versus psychiatric diagnosis? And if I, I just throw this in there as well, and I can I can edit this out if it's out of context. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- this is a quote from your book, Formulation in Psychology and Psychotherapy. It's uh, chapter 12, Controversies and Debates About Formulation. And there's a, there's a, a short paragraph in there which says, there's, there's very little research looking at the question of validity or whether case formulations are meaningfully related to a client's presenting problems for which reliability is a prerequisite, nor is there any clear link between case formulation an improved outcome. Yeah, yeah. On the face of it, that sort of seems to... A big hole in it. It does, <laughs> it, it seems to kind of undermine it. It's Because uh, it's almost yeah. that like, if the criticisms of, of diagnosis are that they're not valid and they're not reliable, if formulation falls victim to the same criticisms, then it's not, I suppose it's not a principled opposition, if that okay. makes sense. That's a very good point. Comes up a lot. Yeah. Um, and my thinking about that has changed a bit since I wrote that chapter, actually. But I think I'd say two things. One is I think it's a great mistake to have a one-to-one head-on comparison of formulation with diagnosis in the same terms. You know, formulation is not aiming to be the foundation of, you know, a branch of the natural sciences like medicine, essentially. You know, in what sense can you really talk about a formulation as, you know, a story of someone's life as being reliable or valid? Do you know what I mean? It's a different kind of entity. And I think I did discuss that in the chapter. Unless we get really away from these kind of issues, you know, we'll be comparing apples and pears. Um, formulations isn't claiming to be some a better kind of diagnosis, or at least from my perspective, it isn't. But the second thing I would say is that actually one of the core definitions of formulation is that it's uh, an individual hypothesis. Having a hypothesis about the reasons someone's difficulties or the reasons for anything is the heart of evidence-based practice. So it doesn't make any sense to say formulations aren't valid in, in the same way as it doesn't make sense to say diagnoses aren't valid. You know, diagnoses vary, some are more valid than others. The formulation as an individual hypothesis tailored to the person sitting in front of you is tested out in practice. You know, the reliability that matters, in a sense, is do the two people who are putting it together agree it makes sense? The validity that matters is do interventions and approaches based on this help to confirm it and to take the person forward where they want to go? So each individual formulation is a, you know, is a hypothesis tested out in practice, which is what we should be doing, is what all evidence-based practice should be about. And it's actually quite bizarre to think that we've, because of the dominance of diagnosis, which should be performing that function, and which does perform that function in general medicine, you know, a diagnosis is also a hypothesis. We think this is pneumonia, we'll treat it like this. It works. Because it doesn't work in psychiatry, we haven't essentially had a hypothesis that fits the person sitting in front of us. Formulation is a way of doing it and a way of tailoring what we do about, about the evidence to the person who you're kind of working with. Yeah, just just to clarify then, I mean, the two things that I kind of picked up on on, on this idea of, of creating a formulation was, and we kind of touched upon it then, one is the idea of a, a true account of what the person's actually been through and mm. and then the idea of causality. So what, yeah. I mean, what, what I mean by that is, I'm guilty of this myself, is guilty of misremembering my experiences and and kind of over dramatizing it so i think the one i was most guilty of was when i talked before about having a period of suicidal ideation mm. i used to refer to that period as the early part of 2015 and or the first few months in 2015 that's not true um when 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 i really examined it and i, I did that properly i went through my browser history and things like this to find out what i was actually doing at the time and the truth of that was that it was actually only a couple of weeks. It's about two weeks, a really intense two weeks where I went through this period. But I'd misremembered it as being months long and this really yeah. 
this really long drawn out process that I just couldn't seem to get through. And so I'd misremembered that experience. Whereas if I, without studying that properly, my form, my case formulation might have included this six month period of suicidal ideation that wasn't true. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one is this idea of causality. So, you know, just because somebody got bullied at school or they had an abusive boyfriend, that might have been a traumatic experience, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a direct causal link between that one particular event and the person having their various struggles that they're having no, no. now. Of course it does. And, and so if you've got a formulation that's not necessarily true and the, the causality isn't verifiable, are you saying that formulation regardless of that that formulation still proves successful okay um interesting complicated questions think about the the causality thing first yeah suppose you're faced with someone who is very anxious and they were bullied at school of course it's true that many people are bullied at school and survive and they're optically affected by it and that might be true for this person or it might not be but the whole point of the formulation would be, um, this is what a formulation is, having that as a possible hypothesis and seeing if it fits and then seeing if proceeding on that basis works. So, for example, you'd be discussing with a person over probably quite a long period, what was it like when you were bullied? Do you remember finding it very upsetting? What are the pro- problems you're currently faced with? Oh, that's interesting. Whenever you're in a group of people, you start being very panicky. Have you thought about why that might be? Oh, so let's think about the last time that happened. Oh, that's interesting. So one of the people you met in that situation, now we think about it, reminds you very much of one of the worst bullies at school, and you're actually feeling quite anxious talking about it. Do do you see what I mean? So you're trying to work out whether those links, those causal links, which are always loose, you know, always, you know, tentative, whether they seem to make sense to that person in this situation. That is formulating, if you like. Of course, you can't necessarily assume bullying has caused your problems. And then the further testing of that hypothesis. Oh, so, OK, we've got some reasons. This is a very early formulation. We've got some reasons to think that part of your problems are to do with this awful period of bullying. And that's why you find it so difficult to be in groups of people. So let's if that's the case, then X, Y and Z might help. Let's try that out. And if it helps, that's further confirmation. So this is it's the process of exploring and testing out possible causal links, which will always remain tentative. So that's one thing. The other thing I'd say about a formulation, this is a kind of interesting point that, you know, often you never know exactly what happened. Often people may misremember things, you know, often there may be significant parts of a person's um, history that are interesting, but the difference between a formulation and diagnosis or other kinds of hypothesis, I guess, scientific hypothesis, is that to some extent um, the usefulness and the personal truth of formulation is independent from the facts to some extent because a formulation is essentially about meaning. So if you're talking, give an example you gave, if I'm working on a formulation with you, it doesn't particularly matter to me whether you were feeling most suicidal between these months or these months. Do you know what I mean? What I'm most interested in is what that felt like to you, what that meant to you, what sense you made of it. That's the important stuff. And that is the linchpin on which the formulation will hinge. Does that that kind of explain it a bit? It does. I just want to kind of push this to its kind of logical conclusion, though, now, because I guess you you could say that if if the gravitational centre of importance is the meaning of of the formulation... If somebody, say, went to a crystal healer, okay, yeah, yeah. and the crystal healer was saying, well, your chakras are out of out of balance and, you know, Mars is in, in the way of Jupiter or whatever, and that's the reason why you're feeling depressed. If that person finds meaning in that and it connects with them, yeah, yeah. does that then make a crystal healing formulation as valid as a psychological formulation? Well... See, here I'm probably going to be well out of step with the rest of my profession <laughs> because that's a very good question. My answer is, my answer would be yes. My answer would be yes. Uh, it, it works. You know, that's what I mean by, in a sense, the meaningfulness and the usefulness of a formulation is independent of the facts. You know, 
generally speaking, probably something that is factually established and has some evidence to support it is likely to be the most useful formulation. We have a lot of facts and evidence about the impact of trauma, for example. But if someone wants to believe something differently and if it's helpful to them to think this isn't trauma, this is my, you know, my malevolent grandfather still tormenting me or the demons that someone wished on me. And if that leads to a useful intervention, you know, I think this where this perspective does allow that you know, respect for people's understandings and respect for this is a big deal. I think respect for cross-cultural understandings, you know, around the world, people have always had what you could in Western terms called formulations, and they look very, very different from Western psychology. And if it works for them, it works for them. I think a kind of really open-minded, quite expanded definition about formulation is, or perhaps what narratives are, allows us to respect those very different ways of understanding as people experiences without falling into this horrible trap of we're going to impose your Western, our Western psychological models on you, you know, which have, formulation works best. Formulation is currently defined works best within Western cultural um, models. You know, I, I don't think it's transport, transportable just like that across the world, and nor should it be in its current form. And I think we have to be very, very open to other forms of narrative and not to think we've got the best and the only kind. Okay, I guess... Yeah, one thing, I, I suppose, is, I guess this is kind of a, a political question, maybe, or maybe not. I wonder if the the idea of, um, well, actually, first, let me clarify something. First, let me clarify something. What is your stance on, if if we actually frame it as, as diagnosis versus formulation, where do you stand on that? Are you for getting rid of diagnosis altogether is like the, the preferable standpoint. Um, are you happy for them to coexist? Do you think that formulation works best in isolation of psychiatric diagnosis? What do you think? I mean, the, 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 the fence sitting position, it would be to say, well, you know, regardless of the evidence, let, you know, let everyone just do what they want and combine it how they like. But where do you stand on that? Well, I stand very clearly that we need to, and we are going to anyway, well above anything that I might desire or argue for or campaign for, get rid of the current diagnostic system. And formulation would be a good but replacement, but not the only one. That's where I stand. When Sorry, when you say that we're going to get rid of of the diagnostic system, do you, do you think that that's something that it's going to be, it needs to be kind of politically and systematically pushed aside? Or do you think it's just kind of crumbling around itself that it's it's just it just doesn't hold up anymore i think well what i've noticed in the last four or five years interestingly is that it's actually crumbling from the inside this is one of the interesting changes you know i and other people have been arguing against it for many many years you know before i was born you know you know back in the anti so-called anti-psychiatry movement we, we actually don't need that campaign anymore you know, it's, it's it's going in its current form it's going in its current form yeah. So actually, it's time, given I mean, the news doesn't seem to be out there, I find it quite extraordinary, actually, people on social media talking about, you know, we have a right to have this and we believe in it. And it's kind of irrelevant. It's not going to exist in its current form for very much longer. So that's where we are. It's actually much more interesting and urgent, I think, to talk about replacements and to make sure that replacements aren't co-opted. But we're in this extraordinary transition period where, you know, it is a slightly complex position to take that 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 is that is my position. We need to and we will abandon diagnostic systems, not only in their current form, but I hope altogether. Um, but in the meantime, we're in a transition period where services are based on them and people need them. Mm. So, you know, and people have a right, as I say, to make up their own minds. So I quite often get challenged on this. Well, what do you think? Well, at the moment, we seem to be in a position where we have to hold multiple, several realities in mind, is what I'd say. And I'm really, really not telling anyone what they should think or do about it. But there are those multiple realities. I try to work with those. I try to respect, you know, certainly service users, different positions on that. Yeah, I mean, we did we, we did sort of skim over it quite quickly before, but it was one of the most kind of damning verdicts on diagnostic classification for me was the whole story about alan francis um so he did he chair the 
the DSM four committee. The D- yeah. So he chaired the DSM four committee, and then came out against it. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, you're in trouble when your biggest opponent is the chair of the previous DSM committee. Yeah, that was uh, that's a very interesting stuff. I've been trying to get hold of Alan to interview him, but he's I can't get hold of him. He, well, he's an interesting guy. I don't go all the way with him. Can, can I read you a quote from a recent United Nations report? It's a brilliant of report. Um, it came out about a month ago. Um, it's It's got this wonderful catchphrase in it, um, from chemical imbalances to power imbalances. So it's saying uh, the crisis in mental health should be managed not as a crisis of individual conditions, but as a crisis of social obstacles which hinder individual rights. Mental health policy should address the power imbalance rather than the chemical imbalance. And it's got lots of really strong statements about Reductive biomedical approaches to treatment that do not adequately address context and relationships can no longer be considered compliant with the right to health. This is about a human rights approach. For decades, mental health services have been governed by a reductionist biomedical paradigm that has contributed to the exclusion, neglect, coercion and abuse of people with intellectual, cognitive and psychosocial disabilities. Persons with autism and those who deviate from prevailing cultural, social and political norms We have been sold a myth that the best solutions for addressing mental health challenges are medications and other biomedical interventions. Public policy continue to neglect the importance of the preconditions of poor mental health, such as violence, disempowerment, social exclusion, isolation and breakdown of communities, systematic socioeconomic disadvantage and harmful conditions at work and in schools. The scaling up of care across the world must not involve the scaling up of inappropriate care. The focus on treating individual conditions inevitably leads to narrow, ineffective, potentially harmful outcomes and paves the way for further medicalisation of global mental health. There's lots more of it. There's about 10 pages of it. That's powerful stuff, isn't it? Yeah, well, speaking of quotes, the one that I found in in your book, Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Diagnosis, was the Alan Francis quote where he just says, there is no definition of a mental disorder. It's bullshit. I mean, you just can't define it. I know. That's a tricky one, <laughs> a tricky one to get past. <laughs> well, I always use that one. But like, look what happens when I try to say it in much more moderate terms on social media. Yeah. You know, to anyone else. It's like, he's, he's bloody said it. It's like, you know, <laughs> people invented it, are saying it's rubbish. They're saying it's bullshit. Are we not allowed to notice this? Are we not allowed to kind of think about it? Are we not allowed to repeat it? We're not allowed to have similar views. I wonder if kind of pulling back from everyone's kind of emotional involvement and people's opinions, subjective opinions about it, I kind of wonder if you may be fighting a a losing battle against diagnosis just from um, an ontological perspective. I think that's the right word in that it's, it's just part of the human condition to want to categorise things to make sense of the world around us. And we put things in boxes in that sense. That's the way that language works. And even though you're talking about maybe, you know, the the idea of the, the DSM becoming invalid and that kind of structure collapsing, I'm wondering whether, just from a language perspective, because we categorise things naturally in a way that we can't choose to just opt out of, whether if even if the existing classification system does collapse and is replaced, is OCD just going to be replaced with a different name? It's still OCD in everything but name, but with a different name, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, that is undoubtedly what's going to happen, I think. And if you look at some of these new categorization systems being drawn up, yeah, called things like High Top and R Doc and things like this. And, um, I've not heard of these ones. Right. Well, they're not. They're, they're all based essentially. They're modifications of the same system. Right. They're, they're kind of saying. Interesting. They're kind of saying we need to get away from these categories because these dividing lines between diagnoses don't exist. So they're more dimensional than categorical, but they're still very medically based. It's about understanding the underlying pathology. So they haven't got very far away from existing thinking. So what you're saying, I mean, you're rightly saying we need a way of grouping things together. Um, you know, human beings need to group things together, need to see patterns. As a clinician, I need to 
you know, have in my head very loose kind of groupings or patterns. So, you know, I wonder if it's this kind of problem or that kind of problem. And I mean, interestingly, in some areas of life, we accept that without needing to turn it into a diagnosis. Like we accept that. Um, well, the example I sometimes give is suppose you came across somebody who was absolutely distraught, tearful, hearing the voice of someone wasn't there, unable to sleep, highly agitated. Um, what would would you say they might be suffering from mental illness? And the answer would probably be yes. And if you said actually their husband was killed in a car crash yesterday, they would say no, it's a bereavement reaction. Those things are normal for you know normal parts of the grief reaction. So nobody thinks grief, at least I, not many people think, as generally we tend to accept that grief is a reaction to a very difficult life circumstance, which doesn't and shouldn't have to be and shouldn't be medicalised. There's no absolute clear categorical differences between grief and not grief, do you know what I mean, or subtypes of grief. There's that sort of ordinary language grouping. This person is experiencing intense grief. Now, in my ideal world, when we'd restored the links between people's experiences and manifestations of distress and the life circumstances that lead to it, we'd have a number of other similar loose categories, ordinary language categories available to us. You know, these are sometimes called in philosophical terms um, fuzzy concepts. Do you know what I mean? It's like they don't have to have, if you're not trying to squeeze it into a diagnostic or medical or natural sciences box, you can live with quite a lot of uncertainty, like hearing voices, in fact, the hearing voices movement. What exactly counts as hearing a voice, not hearing a voice, what kind of voice is, you know, we can work with that loose way of grouping things and, and ordinary language understandings are quite a good way to start. But, you know, that's not what they're thinking about at the top. They're thinking of preserving the current system, desperately shoring up with some variation on the one we have at present. Well, I guess one question would be, uh, well, I've, I said to you before we actually started recording that I'd noticed that in, in some of the Twitter exchanges you've had with people, they resort to ad hominems, which, well, for people that don't know, that what an, an ad hominem is attacking the person instead of the argument. Yeah. And I'm just wondering what, when people are saying that some of the, com, the common accusations thrown at people that have got views that don't, that are critical of, the status quo is that there's some sort of there's some sort of self interest in it for you. Mm, mm. What's what is your motivation? What's in it for you to to, to <laughs> and, and 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 I mean that I mean that from both perspectives. I mean what what's what's the the motivation for you know, pursuing this line of inquiry? Okay, but also why subject yourself to that level of bullshit as well? Yeah, it's my mental illness. It's my mental illness. Um, interesting, because I quite often get asked that, and it's a fair question, but what I, the first thing I always say is, would you go to someone who had the orthodox beliefs, standard mental health worker, and say, what is your motivation for having these beliefs? Do, do you know what I mean? Even asking that question suggests that my position and the position of critics has to be justified in, and explained in, or perhaps explained away in some way that we don't require of the orthodoxy. Does that well, make sense? Let, okay, let me just clarify. I'm, the, the, I'm, not, the, it's not, I'm willing to answer it, but I'm just putting it in a bigger context. You yeah, know? you can answer it in that context, but the, 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 the way I'm thinking about it is that psychologists and people in the mental health profession get a lot of stick about yeah. just being part of this pharmaceutical industry and you know like drug pushers and things like that that's not been my experience of it i think the idea of surely you know somebody goes to university they study they spend all this time researching etc you don't know when you start out on this journey that whether you're mm -hmm. going to be successful and making a lot of money at it or whatever whether you're going to end up on you know being a, a, with interest or stocks or whatever in a pharmaceutical industry you could just end up a regular standard practitioner so mm. surely the best thing to do re is to assume that a person has good motives. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure. And I guess we all have mixed motives for everything we do. But, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is that motives are independent of the validity of the arguments. Yes. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I might be in this for entirely self-centred reasons, but 
doesn't mean my arguments are untrue. Yeah. And of course, motives work both ways. You know, from my perspective, a lot of the motives of defending a system that it seems to me is pretty undefensible, you know, are self interested. Yeah, and on, well, on the flip side, you could you could have the you could have the best possible interest in trying to help people, but inadvertently doing more harm than good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I I start from the position that nearly just about everyone I've ever worked with in the mental health system is there for good reasons and wants to help people. You know, I don't think there are evil people wanting and going to kind of upset people and make make people worse. But it kind of comes back a bit to what we were saying at the beginning. What took me into this line of work well it was partly personal experience yeah and what's kept me going is you know looked at from my perspective i see tremendous i see good work being done and i see tremendous harms being done i see tremendous harms being done and you know insofar i'm not sure if this counts as self-interest or not but it's important to, to me for all sorts of reasons that to feel that you know, I'm doing something meaningful and important in my life. It seems to me that this is an area among many of hurt and injustice and abuse and harm, which I can personally contribute to because, of, you know, it draws on my particular skills. I, I, I actually think I'm quite good at writing, arguing, clinical work, and I think I bring some useful personal experiences to it. So tiresome and exhausting and distressful distressing as it is at times you know it's I, I wouldn't be without it it's you know one of the things along with you know my family my children my friends that makes life meaningful for me so you can call that self-interest if you like but uh, I mean you know we all need to get get something out of what we do don't we and, and I, I get a lot out of what I do and there's nothing more rewarding than you know I'm not working clinic at the moment but being able to work with someone being able to be part of helping them to move forward and there's nothing more rewarding than being able to suggest ideas or interventions or practices or you know resources that will enable other people to do that kind of work as well yeah i think it's 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 important for people that we have people that are critical of the status quo even if it if it's not to completely replace it but just to keep it on track and to constantly hone and improve it yeah i think so I seem to have offered myself as one of the people to fill that slot. But, you know, there are a lot of other people saying similar things. Some of them are sensible enough not to be on Twitter. And, uh, you know, I, so, so, some of this stuff, is, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's complicated. I think some of the abuse I get online, I mean, is, is well, so, some of it's to do with being a woman, I think. And some of it's to do with being prepared to be assertive and articulate. And I notice other other online women who get the same kind of treatment. To be honest, assertive, articulate women who aren't prepared to kind of say I don't I disagree with that. They get a lot of stick as well. Yeah, I just think I just think people, especially service users, need to be need to be more open minded. You don't need to be open minded to the point where your fucking brain falls out, but you just need to be op- open minded to alternatives. And the and the thing that really irritates me about Twitter is is people need to engage. If you're going to engage in debate, engage in debate like an adult. Don't take things out of context. Don't engage in ad hominems and things like that. I haven't got time for that. And one thing I haven't got time for as well is, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a quote unquote service user myself, yes, I know that be, having mental health issues is a very, it's a very emotive subject. It's a very emotional experience, but try and leave the emotion at the door when you're engaging in, in critical arguments with people because it's it's unhelpful. The moment you start saying, well, because I said so, because I've got experience, because I've been through this and you don't know what you're talking about, for me personally, that invalidates your argument. I haven't got time for that for that particular standpoint. I've as a service user, I want to see the I want to see the being a dialogue. I've got no I've got no loyalties to anyone but myself. And I think this idea of formulation facilitates that. Like you've said, yeah. for you personally, for you personally, if somebody gets gets meaning from a crystal healer, fine. The scientific evidence might not be there, but if it helps you and it helps you get through your distress and improve your life and make you happier, if it works for you, that's where your loyalties should lie. And I think people should think about that from every perspective. Fine 
if you want to stick with your diagnosis, like that, that's on you. But don't try and destroy the opposite, the opposite argument, and and purely based on emotion. Don't do it from that perspective. Engage in a in a, in a critical and mature debate about it. So that's my little soapbox moment, anyway, Lucy. I, um, I, I do agree with you. I'm glad to hear you say that. <laughs> um, okay, so let's close this up with my quick fire questions. So the first one okay. is: Do you have any book recommendations? either on this topic or anything else you feel would be of value to the listeners? Um, well, I'm allowed to recommend my own book. Of I course, hope. of course. So, yes. So um, a great deal of what we've discussed today is covered in my book, um, A Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Diagnosis, published by PCCS Books. This is my attempt to make these arguments accessible to people, well, anyone, but particularly people who've been diagnosed, might be diagnosed, or have someone in their family or friendship group who's been diagnosed. And it really, really isn't a kind of anti-diagnosis rant. It's about putting some of the debates in a simple form so that people can make their own choices and be informed. And it's also cheap. It's eight quid from PCCS Books website. And I've got it here. More importantly, it's short. It's and short. Yes, it's short. So it's something like uh, 110 pages, something like that. Mm. And um, what I like about that, I talked about a, a guy called Tim Pitchell in a past episode on procrastination. He's, he's written a book on procrastination. It's very short. And a lot of these books around mental health, or a lot of books around anything that are, that are nonfiction, there's a lot of filler in there. Yeah. There's 500 pages and 400 of them you don't need. Mm. And yeah, this is a good example of one of those books where it's 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 very to the point, very concise, but it's very wide ranging as well. I really enjoyed it. So, Thank um, you. any others? Um, well, my my first book is called Users and Abusers of Psychiatry, and it's a little bit dated now. It needs updating. Um, so the second edition came out in 2000 and it was had a similar aim. It's longer, but it's an overview of the whole psychiatric system and how it started. And it's based on examples of real life experiences. And um, it kind of unpicks the whole thing historically and so on. So that might be worth a read. I mean, there's so many good books out there, to be honest. You know, when I wrote Users and Abusers in the first edition came out in 1989, it was one of only three books on the UK market that, we're taking a critical look at mental health practice. They're everywhere nowadays. There are lots of them. So I like all of them. I don't know where to start, really. I think Joanna Moncrief is very, very good on psychiatric medication and drugs. She's got another book in the Straight Talking Introduction series. Um, there's a very good book by a friend and colleague of mine called Tales from the Madhouse by Gary Sidley. came out recently. There are, um, if you go on the... I would re strongly recommend the Mad in America website, www.madinamerica.com. If you go on there, you'll find almost every book, author, critic, blog that you might want to know about, and you'll end up with a whole lot of recommendations as to where, where to go to go from here, so to speak. So I hope that does. I hope that will do as a starting point. So. Yep. Yeah, I'll include links to all those in the show notes. Okay. Um, right. If you could have unlimited funding to research anything you liked, however niche or bizarre, oh, goodness. what would it be and why? Um, I think that's the most difficult question you've asked me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I really believe in research. I, this is a terrible thing for a psychologist to say. That's an interesting thing to, for a psychologist to say, so I would love for you to elaborate on that. Um, well, I, 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 I do think that 98% of existing mental health research is starts on the wrong premises and therefore gets us nowhere. And I get infuriated by seeing, you know, the funding that goes into it. So, and I actually think we do know an awful lot, largely coming from trauma-informed practice. We've got all the research and evidence we need, more than enough to change things in an evidence-based way. I, you know, I think the main priority is not research, but clinical practice you know we know what to do let's get on and do it so i'm i'm going to take your large sum of money and i'm going to set it up so that the funding's actually going into setting up a, a non-diagnostic trauma-informed clinical facility with lots of evaluation to demonstrate what we already know that if we offer people 
listening and understanding and hear their stories, actually they recover. That's going to be my research project. I'm going to take over the whole of Bristol and all its clinical facilities and it's going to be amazing. And then when it's published, um, everyone will find a way of proving that actually I didn't have a proper control group or something. So no one will take any notice, but there will be, <laughs> be a lot of recovered people around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not sure if this would be a, a similar answer. I can frame this a little differently. If you could take the reins of power at the Department of Health, what policy would you implement to improve the mental well-being of the general public? And I always say, think very dictatorially. Well, there's absolutely no doubt, I think, that social inequality vastly increases emotional distress, mental distress, and every other form of social ill. You know, Wilkinson and Pickett's book, The Spirit Level, that's a good one to read. Yeah, we've had that one recommended before. Yeah, it's really good, but essentially it's about the kind of long-term impacts of economically unequal society is the gap between the richest and poorest and it shows beyond doubt i think one of their more important findings is that if the uk was as economically kind of equal as the most equal societies in the western world which tend to be sort of scandinavian countries it would probably eliminate more than half of what we currently see as mental illness so that that's not specifically the department of health's remit but and more specifically, you know, we have to look at, you know, we have to stop trying to mop up the tap and leave the tap running and look at, you know, support for, you know, families when their children are young, to look at decent housing, to look at education, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. That, that's that's where it starts. Well, you know what the accusation is going to be on Twitter now? Lucy Johnston wants to implement a Stalinist dictatorship in the UK. I do. <laughs> I might as well say it. I'm going to be accused of it. You offered me the chance and I've taken it. <laughs> what, if anything, keeps you up at night? Um, what, if anything, keeps you up at night? Dunno. I'm just, you know, uh, work plays my interests and take play too large a part in my life. So I, I guess... It's not necessarily a bad thing, but thinking, planning, all that kind of stuff, work-related stuff. But, I mean, not not much keeps me up at night, to be honest. I, I, I manage to get by. I manage not to be driven crazy by this stuff myself. Does the, cri- does the criticism take its toll? I mean, at a personal level? Um, it, it does take its toll. Yeah, it does take its toll. You know, and I, I, don't, I don't like it. I think I've got better at dealing with it and, you know, absolutely no way is it going to stop me. How how do you deal with it? Um, well, you know, in a way, the more extreme the criticism, the less hurtful it is, because it's so obviously about either the other person or some other issue than about me. So that kind of stuff rolls off my back relatively easily. Um, I mean, I'm, what, what does sometimes is more likely to be upset me if it's someone I like and respect who seems to kind of be really disagreeing at some fundamental level. But that doesn't often happen. You know, I, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's that famous phrase, which I'm going to misquote, which is um, something, I think Gandhi said it, or and probably several people had versions of it. First, they ignore you, then they attack you, then they laugh at you, then you win. It's something like that. I'd, I'd much, much rather be in the attack stage. You know, I think for a long time, critics have been in the ignore stage. We're well into the attack stage now. We're on the verge of winning. So I reframe attacks and criticisms as a sign that really important things are being said and really important interests, you know, which are often malign interests, are are under threat. And, you know, we are regrouping. Change is is happening. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. More attacks, please. More criticism, please. (laughs) Yeah, that's an interesting take on it. I'm just going to throw this question in. We'll we'll get back onto these in, in a sec. Just hypothetically... Let's say some genius university student out there suddenly stumbles on a blood test that predicts these mental health issues as distinct entities. Would you say, all right, fine. And if, if, we, if we found that, that medical basis for each and every diagnosis, would you concede defeat and say, okay, f- fair enough, I was wrong? Um, well, 
it's entirely possible and likely that small subsections of what we currently call mental illness will be found to have some biological, mainly biological causes, you know, in among this rag bag of diagnoses applied to this very heterogeneous group of people, there will almost undoubtedly be some with un- undiagnosed, let's say, nutritional deficiencies or hormonal imbalances. Indeed, that quite commonly happens, doesn't it? They end up in, you know, mental health hospitals with, you know, physical health difficulties. And actually, psychiatrists are usually among the worst at picking that up. So to a limited extent, well, you know, great, let's separate those out. Those are not mental illnesses. They are undetected physical illnesses. Is that going to happen to the whole lot? Well, I'm perfectly happy to say I will accept that evidence because it's never going to happen. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? Because actually we know, we know, we know, we know what causes emotional distress. We know it, we know it, we know it. You know, only by ignoring vast, vast amounts and accumulating amounts of evidence about the impact of poverty, trauma, inequality, abuse, neglect, you know, only by ignoring all of that could you possibly imagine that somehow there's going to be some biomarker that better explains why human beings don't like be, uh, being abused, beaten, traumatised, marginalised, forced to live in poverty and all the rest of it. Yeah, it just, so it, it just, I'm not too worried about that possibility. Okay, it did that, yeah, that <laughs> hypothetical just, yeah, just occurred to me. Okay, these are the final five questions, and these are these are the big ones. What's the best piece of life advice anyone's ever given you? Um, I don't think anyone's ever said that this to me explicitly, but I, there have been people in my family, I guess, who have demonstrated to me that it's important to have principles and to act on them, principles and values principles, values and meanings. So I guess that's how I try to live my life. I think there's a few things more important than that. What mistakes do you continue to make despite knowing better? Oh God, um, you mean work-related or life-related? Whatever, whatever sprang to mind first, whatever that question conjures up most vividly. Well, I, I, I don't keep my work and my campaigning in within reasonable limits quite often. You know, I, I, I don't lead a balanced enough life. I'm trying at the moment. I'm trying at the moment. Too work heavy. I'm working at it. It's an ongoing project. One day I'll have a work-life balance. <laughs> One day my family will stop being cross at me, <laughs> spending so much time on these obscure interests. <laughs> what part of your career are you most proud of? Um, well, for a while I worked on and subsequently headed up the Bristol Clinical Psychology Training Doctorate, which was a training program for clinical psychology trainees, uh, which ran from 2001 to 2010. Um, it was, I think, something I enjoyed more than anything else I've done. And we were, during that time, we were able to turn out about 150 graduates who were encouraged and I think successfully encouraged to take a critical and reflective perspective on all aspects of mental health practice. So a slightly different group of clinical psychologists than some. It's a very successful course and long, complicated story, but it was quite ruthlessly and we still believe illegally closed down in 2010 and my entire team was sacked and that's how I ended up in South Wales, so it doesn't always pay to be a critic, and it wasn't directly to do with our philosophy, but nor was it completely um, independent from that. So, but I think that's that's one of the, certainly one of the things I'm proudest of. Actually, we we had a good course, we had a good course, and though the course no longer exists, you know, the Bristol spirit I hope is out there, embodied by our former trainees, and and indeed the staff. Well, you can't kill an idea. That's what they say. You can't kill an idea. Exactly. 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 Outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfilment? Yeah, and you're trying hard to find a part of me that has led a more interesting life. I can see that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if this is quite what you're asking, but um, you know, at school, what I was meant to be good at was um, English, English literature, and English writing. And I, you know, I, I, I love English literature. I, I read a lot. You know, that brings me a lot of pleasure, I think. A favourite author, favourite book? Uh, Jane Austen is undoubtedly, without question, the, the finest English novelist that we have ever been privileged to 
to read and learn from. A very good psychologist, I would say. <laughs> Which book would you recommend someone start with? Emma. Emma. Well, no, start with Pride and Prejudice because it's kind of an easy way in. You've not read any Jane Austen? I've not read any Jane Austen. I'm quite a literature buff myself, but more, I'm I'm American Southern Gothic, Faulkner and, and Cormac McCarthy, yeah. That's my thing. Oh, uh, that's, very, that's very different. Read, read Pride and Prejudice as an easy way in, but Emma, I think, is her most perfect novel. I've read it so many times that there's no point in me reading it anymore. <laughs> I, I, I read the first sentence and I can I know what the rest of the paragraph is, but <laughs> it's, it's still a pleasure to pick up. Okay, the big one. What do you think is the key to happiness? Oh God, I, I, I'm not. I'm not really big on the whole happiness agenda, whether as codified in the American Constitution or as promoted by Lord Layard and his friends. I, I, I don't think that's what we should be aiming for. To be honest, I mean, I, 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 th- I think the key is probably to aim, you know, to as people often say, is to have that as a byproduct. You know, and I think contentedness and satisfaction with the way you're leaving, ways you're leading your life is a better aim than happiness. Happiness is like to come out of that if, you, if you're doing things mostly right, but also so will a lot of struggles, you know, that, that's life. So what's the key to contentedness? Uh, friends, community, values, beliefs, meaningful work. Freud, to love and to work. Yes. <laughs> okay lucy have you got any links you'd like to recommend people pay a visit to uh, and if you'd like to give your social media details out anything like that um well you can see me wasting far too much time on twitter if you go to at clin psych lucy c-l-i-n-p-s-y-c-h lucy i would recommend the web uh, facebook group that's recently been set up called um drop the disorder question mark it's um, run by some colleagues and um, friends and allies of mine, Drop the Disorder. It's a, it's kind of a bit of a British version of the Mad in America site, but it's a very good, it's recent, it's shaping up to be a very good site for all manner of critical discussion and articles and resources and um, support and advice quite often around kind of alternative perspectives on mental health. So have a look at that. If you go on a website called www.adisorderforeveryone. dot and the four is the figure four, a disorder for everyone dot, you will find that I and some colleagues are travelling the country with a series of one day workshops, which have been very well received, which are jointly led by professionals and. Um, um, local survivor service users, which are about a lot of the things we've been discussing today, about formulation-based practice, about trauma-informed practice, about uh, critiques of diagnosis and alternatives. So try to catch one of those. I promise you, you won't regret that. Sorry, Lucy, is that .com or .co.uk or...? Uh, .com. .com. A disorder for everyone .com. That's it. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Lucy Johnston, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, folks, if you enjoyed this episode, you, well, actually, for those of you who didn't enjoy this episode, you guys can bugger off and skip this bit because it doesn't apply to you. But if you did enjoy this episode and you'd like to help support this podcast, there are a number of ways you can do so. You could blast out a little mention on social media saying, yeah, check this knobhead out, he's actually pretty good. You could like our Facebook page or leave us a review there, even better. Just search for My Own Worst Enemy on Facebook. I'm sure we'll pop up. You could leave us a positive review on iTunes or Stitcher or whichever podcast service you happen to use. It's always a a nice way of encouraging new listeners to give us a whirl. Or if you're feeling particularly generous and you feel that this podcast is genuinely adding some value and you'd like to support it in a more long-term sense, then you can become a subscriber for as little as a pound a month. Or you could just make a one-off donation, again, for as little as a pound. So, yeah, if you'd like to sponsor the podcast, just go to myownworstenemy.org forward slash support. But only if you can afford it and, you know, no donations from stolen credit cards either, please. Can't be arsed with that hassle. So, yeah, plenty of things to keep you busy there while I go busy myself putting the next episode together. So, in the meantime, as I always say, Behave yourselves, but not too much, and I'll see you again next time.